Good morning uh, and welcome. Welcome to those on Zoom as well as those who are here in person. We will uh, reconvene our meeting for the hearings for the long-term plan. And welcome to Friday, 3rd of May. So we'll go straight into hearing from our submitters. So first up this morning, we've got uh, Tamana, Tamanawa. So come and join us up at the table, um, Susanna. And uh, submission is on page two for our elected members. Uh, please, please take your submission as read and you're welcome to speak to it. And then there may be some questions. Uh, just pop that on green. So, yep, green, and you're good to go. Uh, tēnā kata katoa. Thank you, Salt. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you so much for having us here and giving us the opportunity to speak to our submission for the long-term plan. My name is Susanna Shadbold. I'm the Chief Executive of Tamanawa in Palmerston North, and I've got with me Graham Beale, who's our Senior Manager, Marketing and Comms. Uh, I'm trying to make this work but at the moment this is the, this is our slide i do want to acknowledge the support received from manawatu district council um, and show how important it is that council despite a time of rising costs continues to play its part in supporting an asset such as te Manawa that fosters the well-being and shared identity of all of us te Manawa is a testament to the legacy of our arts science and heritage, and our pioneers that inspire a new generation of talented individuals. Almost 120,000 visitors have come through our doors since July 2023, and even more are continuing to engage with us online as we grow our storytelling capabilities and outreach through multimedia. By the way. Thank you. Te Manawa has an important mission to serve the people of Manawatu as a vibrant and exciting cultural destination and through enhancing the economic and social well-being of our community. One of the big highlights of a summer was the International Touring Exhibition Six Extinctions, a premium experience we were able to offer free of charge to our communities. More than 35,000 people visited the exhibition, which had an estimated economic impact of $6 million to the region. At the forefront of our minds is removing barriers to access and participation. And from early last year, we began delivering our learning programs to schools free of charge. Close to 3,000 Manawatu district residents participated in our free programs and more than 200 schools from within the district visit to Manawa each year, including Lytton Street and Halcombe School, as well as Hatapara College, Fielding Intermediate, North Street School, Rongotea School and Ruahini Kindergartens. In addition, to Manawa provides education loan kits that can be used in the classrooms. We want to ensure that we can continue offering these learning opportunities free of charge to schools and education providers in the region. Our museum in a box on and off-site visits, senior events and curator talks are particularly well attended by fielding rest homes, provis and garden groups. Te Manawa events are also hosted twice a year at Fielding Craft Market and at Manfield Park. And we are currently in discussion with Manawatu District Council events and the library to develop future events. Oops. As a free facility, Te Manawa is a popular destination for schools and families. We are proud to be a homegrown museum and we have built a legacy of trust and collaboration over the past 25 years. I'm sure you all recognize the image. <laughs> um, Te Manawa cares for thousands of objects in a collection that tells the stories from people all over Manawatu, not just Palmerston North. It is a place where legacies thrive in being shared, and we have begun the ambitious task of digitizing our collection, allowing visitors to discover our collections off-site. 
Last year, we were able to acquire the Peter Bush archive of over 300,000 photographic items and successfully secured funding from Lotteries, Environment and Heritage to preserve, document and provide access to this nationally and internationally significant collection in partnership with our friends from the Rugby Museum. Our focus for the next few years is to integrate Te Ao Māori across the museum to develop a new science centre to preserve, document, and provide access to the Peter Bush collection, and to upgrade our semi-permanent exhibitions. Te Manawa is grateful to receive an annual grant from Manawatu District Council. It has helped to support projects and activities that we offer free to the people of our region. But the cost of delivering those activities is increasing at unprecedented levels. As museums across the country look to, at ways to keep the lights on, we ask that Council consider reviewing the grant amount in light of those factors. While we are conscious that times are tough across the board for everybody, an increase would be the first such adjustment in over two decades. We believe that continued support from the region will help ensure that Te Manawa has an opportunity to shine brighter, to be more accessible, to continue to provide free learning programs, outreach and events that engage visitors, and ensure the unique story of our place in Aotearoa is told. I would once again like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to our submission as part of the region's long-term plan. Um, I'm not sure where we are for time. We have um, a, a video actually at the end of the slide. If there's still time, a three-minute video, or are we running out of time? No, let's let's have a look at it. Yeah, thank you. That's very nice, and it sort of introduces our We Museum campaign. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Done by Graham, by the way.
Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, let's open it up. Any questions from our team? I'll start the questions. Um, you talked about increasing costs the same as, you know, everybody um, and how we manage that. You talked about the grant that you've had from council um, hasn't had any increase for at least 20 years. What sort of increase um, figure, did you have a figure in mind? Uh, yes, we would like uh, we would be happy with a hundred thousand per annum. Thank you. Uh, any further questions around the table? Yeah, Councillor Short on Zoom. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Stunning video. Um, last year, Mayor Helen and I joined the Palmerston North City Council for a behind the scenes tour, and I think we were both really, really surprised how out the back, it's quite a rabbit warren, and um, you really are struggling for storage space. And I just wondered, are there any plans for um, additional space or even an additional building to help you with your growing collection? Uh, <laughs> good question, very loaded question that I'm sure Graham can chip into. Um, yes, we certainly have plans and we are working towards this also with um, Palmerston North City Council. It's really part of the uh, wider cultural precinct discussion. So we, uh, the building, the facility is currently in the long-term plan for year six, seven uh, with uh, Palmerston North City Council. Um, but there will be, I think uh, it has a price, uh, a tag of 67 million, um, but we, we will have to raise 90% of that. Um, but at the moment, it's just, a, uh, I see it as a commitment to a new facility because as you would have seen, and thank you for joining us, uh, it was um, never a purpose-built facility. I think it's about nine office buildings that were just put together. So we, we certainly have a lot of um, storage issues, um, display issues as well, and um, leaks. And, well, and health, health and safety issues for your staff too. Yes, absolutely. So we are definitely working, um, we're doing what we can um, to work within the current spaces, but we are um, definitely working towards a new purpose built facility. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Councillor Bell. Morena, tēnā korua. I just have one question. Can you explain a bit more what the Matauranga Rangitani program is? Um, yes, so this is working within the um, New New Zealand history curriculum. So we've worked with um, community groups and then uh, Pamutana Histories, uh, Warren Warbreak, Virginia Warbreak, and Dr. Viv Aitken to develop two new Mataranga Māori programs. And we are looking at developing more and having um, having this across the whole museum rather than in isolation as well. And is the program centred around mana whenua of Yes. And that's what's called on your yeah. Yes, absolutely. Would you be open to expanding that further and having a similar relationship with other hapu of Manawatu? Absolutely. We would love to. Kia ora. Thank you. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Susanna uh, and Graham. Um, can you just give us an, a quick overview of where most of your funding comes from? Yes, so most of, most of the funding comes from Palmerston North City Council, um, and then we generate uh, oh about twenty percent, I think, of our own funding through um, grant uh, grant sponsorship um, sales uh, from our retail spaces um, and uh, other. Yes, yes, yeah, funded grants, sponsorships. Yeah, so many grants and sponsorships. So we've got a target that we um, have set every year that we need to reach as well. Thank Does you. that answer the question? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you to you both. Thank you for the, the good work that you do um, for our region. Um, and thank you for your submission and coming today. And uh, as, you, as you know, we've got a number of um, submitters to here and then we have the challenge of deliberations and deciding where we go, like everybody else with a limited budget. So, um, but thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for having us here today. Kia ora.
Okay, so let's now jump to the Cancer Society submission. Uh, we're on page 10. Um, Josie, welcome. Come and join us. So thank you for your submission, which we have read, so you can take, take that as read. Morning, Nathan. Good morning. Wearing a different hat this morning. I think it's still the same hat. <laughs> yeah. um, Good course. So... Um, Thank you for your submission. We have read it. Uh, you're welcome to speak to it, and then there may be some questions. Is this on? Yeah. If it's green, it should be on. <laughs> uh, kia ora koutou. My name's Josephine. I um, am a health promoter for the Manawatu Cancer Society. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, with you today. Um, Nathan here is here to support my submission as he's um, added a bit into it. Um, my submission focuses on the vital role Manawatu District Council plays in the community wellbeing and development, creating a safe and inclusive environment for the community to thrive. The Council identifies a vision of providing the Manawatu community with resilient infrastructure to serve the health and wellbeing of the community in their, long, in their draft long-term plan, as well as using community input and collaboration to support and help implement a wellbeing framework to community development. In my written submission, I provided 13 recommendations to consider towards the Council's long-term plan. Today, I'll focus on the three that are of top priority to the Cancer Society. Firstly, I asked the Council to amend their smoke-free 2022 policy to include stronger vape-free regulations than it currently does. The long-term health impacts of exhaled and inhaled vapour from vaping products are still unclear, although current research is showing negative changes to respiratory health in vapours as well as negative mental health issues in rangatahe who have picked up the habit. Rangatahe nicotine addiction is on the rise with very little support available for Fano. I recently had a corridor with Nathan Stewart, the principal of Fielding High School, who expressed his concern for the lack of help available for families who are desperately searching for aid for their nicotine addicted children. He described this epidemic not too dissimilar to how party pills craze hit our communities, reflecting on his advocacy in the campaign to ban those. Local councils have a role to play in advocating and protecting our communities from harm. Decision makers need to know we are in need of stronger regulations around these substances. It is a necessity for our communities. Making smoke-free areas also vape-free reduces the risk of vaping becoming normalised, particularly among non-smokers and young people. It reduces public confusion, making smoke-free and vape-free policy easier to enforce. It's important to take a stand against these products that are taking hold of our rangatahe. We need to protect our future generation. To make this possible, it is important to include vaping in all points of the policy statement, including adding vape-free onto signage alongside smoke-free where it's stated in the policy. We need to have vape-free added to new and existing council-controlled organisations policies, as well as making council-controlled events vape-free alongside already being smoke-free. Lastly, all funding and events that must meet a smoke-free criteria should also meet a vape-free criteria. These additions will strengthen Council's support towards creating a healthy and safe environment for the community, as well as impact our future generation's health and well-being. Second, I ask that Council recommit to their smoke-free 2022 policy. It's important more than ever to have a firm ground on which local policy is seen as the way forward. Local Council has an important role to play in the health and well-being of our community, we must look to improve and establish strong policy that creates well-being enhancing environments. Supporting, preventing and reducing the risk of non-communicable diseases, for example cancer, and help people live healthier lives. It is, a, it is of concern that local smoking statistics of Manawatu are higher than that of the national average, and in particular concerning higher rates for Māori. This gives compelling reasons as to why this needs to be a priority. Smoking remains a significant threat to New Zealanders' public health, especially in Māori and Pacifica communities. <clears throat> no, I've lost my race. Sorry. Smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in New Zealand. We must not be complacent when it comes to policy implementation. Further work is needed put to be put into the promotion of the policy to showcase Manawatu as a community that cares for the health of its people. Investment into further signage, not just for smoke-free but for vape-free sm spaces as well, sends the message that we uphold our policy statement of committing to be a smoke-free and vape-free community. Lastly, creating a safe and healthy environment for the community should include prioritising reducing the risk of overexposure to UV radiation. 
Skin cancer is one of the most common cancers in Aotearoa. We have the highest incidence and death rate in the world. I want to commend the parks and planning team on their mahi towards shade development already. The introduction of shade sales in parks around Manawatu shows a dedication towards protecting their community. Council can improve support for this mahi by providing the team with policy that ensures sun protection is a key principle of the council's commitment to the health of our community and its workers. I ask council to adopt a sun protection policy. This enables shade planning to be incorporated as part of council's planning processes, recognises council's responsibility as an employer of outdoor workers and contractors, and reinforces the role council as community reinforces the role of council as community educators and community event organisers. The surrounding councils in the mid-central region have current sun protection policies in place, including Horofenua District Council, Palmerston North City Council and Napier City Council, with advocacy in other districts being ongoing. The commitment to community health and wellbeing showed by these surrounding councils puts our region on the map as a lead for these initiatives in the country, so why wouldn't we want to be involved? If you have a look at the outdoor pools, parks, preserves, sports grounds and schools, are these places that encourage families to be physically active and not at increased risk of skin cancer because of the lack of shade? A shade order of local outdoor spaces would help assess existing shade and identify additional shade requirements in planning for outdoor locations. We recommend that an equity lens is used in shade planning of neighbourhood spaces prioritizing socio, lower socioeconomic communities and that high use play spaces have adequate shade and water available so that a higher proportion of people will likely be able to use it. As always, the Cancer Society is here to offer support in the development and implementation of policies that will help strengthen community wellbeing. Thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, is there anything you would like to add? I'll just, just say... Um... Oh, it's a bit of deja vu for those of us that have been in this town with the party pools and then the synthetics. I remember even with some of the people in the room, we uh, jumped in a, in a car, sort of in a bit of a convoy. We drove around various dairies and, and uh, went through the process of trying to shut the sale of those things down. Now we've got about 2,500 kids on or near North Street that go to three schools there. You've got three dairies that have converted themselves into vape shops. Uh, it's meant to be a tool to get people off of smoking. You, you've got eight-year-olds up a tree at this school and you've got this happening and this happening. It, it's right through our young and, and we have an opportunity to either nip it in the bud or it, it goes, gets more entrenched, gets more in vogue and then it's going to be harder to, to get ourselves out of that scenario. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to talk. It was, it was sort of a chance phone call that happened uh, earlier this week but it's a no-brainer for me. There's a bit of an opportunity here to make a good call. Not sure what your power is to make that call. Uh, we've also had uh, conversations with Suze Redmayne and uh, Mr Luxon as well, uh, pre and post him being our Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was going to be part of my question about, um, you know, unsure how far Council is able to do, but obviously we have a um, lobbying role, strong lobbying role to do that. Mm. And... And and you talk about events making them vape smoke free, and I helped out at the six sixty concert. And when I saw the number of young people, particularly young women, um, outside vaping, um, it was astounding. So, yeah, um, it is something that we do need to look at and see what role we can play in that. So um, let's open it up to the team. Any questions? No, um, very self-explanatory. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for your submission. Thanks, Nathan, for supporting this. And uh, we will come back to you once we've done our deliberations. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Your Worship, can I ask a question? Sorry. Councillor Quarry, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, hard one. How many kids would be active in smoking, in, in your estimation? Uh, I don't have those numbers on me, I do have the numbers of um, from a survey that was put out for vaping, not smoking as such. The smoking levels of children are lower than the vaping, but the problem with that is it was you. It was vaping was supposed to be used as a cessation tool for smokers, but now people are picking up vaping instead of smoking, so they didn't even have 
um, the opportunity to go and pick up smoking first kind of thing. Um, so within a survey that was done of 19,000 students across 283 schools, 26% of those reported vaping regularly. So that's um, two to three times a day um, in the last week. Um, and 15% reported smoking. So it's a lower rate for smoking, but a higher rate um, of students. And the age of those? That was um, high school students. So that was between how old are year nines? 13? 12 to, 12 to 18. Yeah, 12 to 18 year olds. Mm. Yeah. 36%. Yeah. 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 So, and that's higher than the smoking rates in your district overall for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. Um, what? Thank you. Uh, thank you again for coming. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay, uh, moving along. Welcome to Cameron from the Manawatu Tenants Union. We're on page 23. Welcome. Thank you for your submission and um, take it as read and you're welcome to speak to it and there may be some questions. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, councillors, for having me uh, along. It's always nice to come to the fielding chamber when I get the uh, a chance. So it's really just, for me, it's uh, acknowledging the work that we have been doing over the last two years in terms of the strategic priority work with the community development team around supporting tenancies and, and those in housing in the fielding in Manawatu district. Uh, and it's really about cementing that work and carrying that on. And it's really at the point of time of, of a plea to really double down um, and support the community. I understand we need to invest in our roads and our infrastructure because I'm a big believer we don't want, uh, you know, polluting the rivers, et cetera. But at the same time, we also need to be supporting the community agencies, the community networks that our families and community are connecting and working with. Um, and I mean, in terms of rates increase, I know it's huge across the country with the, the sheer number of that we're having to, the reality of we're having to deal with. But it's also when decision makers are in this in this point is remembering that not everybody uh, owns a house or a property that directly pays rates. Our renters and tenants pay rates through their rent increases. And when landlords are facing 20, 15, 30% rate increases, that directly gets passed on to tenants through the rent increase. And it doesn't, you know, 15% rate increase, but if someone's rent goes up by $20 a week, they don't have any ability to cut costs or, you know, save more money. There's only so much you can reduce your power, you can reduce your phone, you can, you know, not buy groceries or live off beans and rice. And so that's also money that is taken away from them that they would be spending in the local economy you know, at the shops and the supermarkets and all those things. And so it's just a, bear, a, a reminder to say, hey, tenants and renters also pay rates and that these increases will affect them. And just to, you know, share their voice at the at the table too, because they don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily rate pass, they often don't uh, put submissions in. I know some do. Um, and so it's just saying, hey, we're here and we would like to see an increase in community funding for our agency, yes, but also for others who are doing this work. Um, you know, I know Manchester House here and here does a lot of work and I think, you know, increasing those supports because when times get tougher and rents go up, all those people are going to go to these services for help and they're already probably underfunded and overworked. So adding to their workload or their, their services or their wait times is going to cause more distress for our, our families and I just want to make sure that we bear that in mind is that tenants tenants are also rate payers and so that's why I wanted to submit. So my view around costs and sharing that out is how can we spread these costs across the most number of people to make it the most fair and equitable way of sharing the costs out amongst everybody who users at so uh, uh, apologies if my submissions on the the road <laughs> etc didn't make any sense because i just i wasn't really sure in terms of the the road structure but it's about for me it's about how do we share those costs more equitable for everybody across 
everybody who's going to use these services. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming and raising those concerns with us, um, which we certainly hear. Let's open it up. Are there any questions for Cameron? Councillor Ford. Yeah, thank you, Cameron. And I'll be somewhat sarcastic and say welcome to Levin. <laughs> but um, <laughs> given that the um, submission was to the Horofanua District Council. But um, what I want to ask you is, in relation to rates increase, <clears throat> we, um, I guess we agree with you uh, in terms of trying to keep the costs down as much as possible. What is your view of our proposed, our draft um, long-term plan with 7.09% for year one and an average of just over 5% for over, across the 10 years? And I understand that compares to about an average of 15% across the country. I, I think you're you're probably uh, in a really good space. Um, I mean, I know Palmerston City Council is looking at 11 11% uh, in the first year, uh, and going up, it's you're you're in the kind of that middle of the range. Uh, and I think the reality of it is, when we've had such high inflations and such high uh, cost growth, we have to we have to balance that out because we can't keep we can't increase rate. We cannot. We can't choose not to increase rates uh, that don't keep up with the increasing costs, and it's just really hard when, you know, uh, inflation is five percent, but the cost of building a bridge has gone up by thirty percent. Um, you can't really balance the two out, and unfortunately, we just have to build bridges and build roads, and they are the cost. But we can't, we can't not do it. And I would also sit here and question and challenge that we have to be mindful that. The more we push projects down the road, the more it's going to become financially unsustainable in years to come. Because all we're going to do is we're just going to keep pushing things down the line, and it's going to get to the point where they become a crisis, and we have to do something, and we won't have an objection. We won't have any ability to change costs. Um, so just that's also the other the other swing on it is let's level out those costs. Thank you, Cameron. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bell. Morena Cameron. Welcome back to the Chambers. Morena. This might be an unfair question, and I think I've asked this to you before, <clears throat> particularly because here we can see it's hora whenua, but do you have data that you can share with us about the demographics of those that rent in our Manawatu district? Uh, I, I can. I would have to. Uh, I can send it through to Janine and the team to get it uh, to you if you like. I just don't have it on me now, but I can get it to you. Why I say that, because it associates to our funding mixes, because one of the things in our deliberations that we're going to have to think about is a lot of the time we hear discussions in the community of rural versus urban. And it's really important that you've mentioned that, you know, we have to also take into consideration those that are renting in specific villages and obviously in fielding. Yes. So that's really important data for us, Cameron. Yeah, no, I can, I can, I can hunt that out and get that to you guys. I appreciate the request, and it's not wasn't part of my submission, but we have just recently done a, a sort of a, a quick uh, state of the nation survey in terms of uh, renting and affordability across the, the whole Manawatu district and Palmerston North region, um, and we got some good responses. But the indication so far is that eighty five percent of the people who did the survey are facing severe financial hardship from the cost of rents. So data shows us at council that we've got an ageing demographic in our Manchu district. Are you finding that that's also something that's coming through your referrals? Yes, absolutely. A lot of older generation uh, that are struggling of, to find rentals? Yeah, a lot of... Uh, I don't... I don't, I don't because we don't necessarily capture a lot of the specific age data because we just I just capture a range from, you know, 60... 60 plus, because uh, that's often where a lot of the, where a lot of the, our older community can start going into, I don't want to say retirement facilities, but those sorts of um, supported living spaces. Uh, I know uh, about two months ago, I dealt with a, a pensioner who was in the Napier uh, Council pensioner housing, and they were, they were on a, facing an increase of about $45 a week rent, and their weekly rent was going to be equal to what their pension was coming in as. And so as a mindset is that 
these pensioners and retirement people are literally living off savings to pay for things like groceries and power. And so they might be in a better position if they own their property, but the money for rates has still got to come from somewhere, mm. you know, and that's, <clears throat> that is the mindset. And I understand it's rural. And when we're dealing with such a large rural scape, that it can affect people un, unfairly. And so for me, it's about, like I say, how do we balance that out? Thank you, Cameron. I look forward to seeing case studies that are relevant yes. to our district. Yeah, no, Thank we you. can get those to you. Thank you. Uh, final question, Councillor Belsky. Um, have you thought of lob uh, lobbing um, government, central government, on uh, the GST return coming back to the local council? Because I think there may be a time, this may be the time to put pressure on government to allow that GST, that the owners and then and are paying on their rates which is a tax on a tax yes come back so i think it well worth a try i am i am absolutely uh i am my my position is i am i am for that i just i don't understand why you know we have to pay gst on rates and then you know we loom long with like you say with the tax on a on a tax it seems frightening pointless good time to to lobby government um yes and that's all part of the uh, the campaigning at the moment yeah. around how we can smooth yeah. these things out and I think for development as well because that's going to be a key way of how we can encourage more housing developments in the area is take out a, a cost burden for developers which is that GST where they're forking out all this money but they have to do that at the start and they don't get any returns until three or four years down the track when they can actually start renting out the properties. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Cameron, for your submission and coming along today. Uh, and um, as you know, we'll ha have to make uh, do some deliberation and then we will come back to you with the outcomes. Appreciate it. And thank you for time. your time. And apologies for the uh, typo. I was sending those submissions out to uh, every council around the place. So I didn't, yeah, apologies for that uh, typo. Understand. There. Just having thank, you on. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Cheers. Have thank a good you. day. Right, moving on. Uh, we're on page 44. Welcome, Ben. Come and join us at the table. Familiar face. Kia ora. Uh, we have your submission. We've read it. You're welcome to speak to it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I don't really have too much to say on the submission itself. Mainly the only thing I really wanted to come and talk about was the parking situation. So um, as you can see in my submission, I'm questioning as to why it's being made a district-wide issue for ratepayers rather than a business issue. Um, businesses were the ones that advocated for the changes. And at, from what I recall, it was going to cost them about $200 a year if it was going to be solely funded through um, a rates rise for them. Um, if the solution isn't going to get them $200 an extra year in business, then I don't see why we're pushing ahead with the parking changes that we are. Um, as a happy alternative, I don't mind some contribution coming from ratepayers, but I think it's a bit cheeky for businesses to push for these changes, to push for what it is that is going to essentially benefit them and not necessarily the wider community. We've got situations where people in Himatangi and Rangiotu and Rangatea they don't necessarily come in to shop in Fielding. They shop in Palmy because it's closer to them. And yet we're being asked to, they're being asked to fork out money to support private businesses, not a community thing, but private businesses. So that's what I really wanted to say on that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, this council has pushed back quite a lot on government uh, policies over the last few years and changes. Uh, Three Waters being the main one through uh, Communities for Local Democracy and the encroachment of central government into local body politics. And I'd really like to see a strong statement from this council regarding the um, directive from the government regarding the Māori wards. I think that um, it'd be quite hypocritical of us not stepping in and making a strong statement on that. Um, we've been pushing back against that overreach from government for a long time. Seems like it'd be a very hypocritical thing hypocritical thing to not do now. So other than that, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Um, question on the parking. So given that we are a growing community um, and we need to keep a vibrant business community, 
um, so you do, you so you don't see that there's a benefit to the residents in our community as as the wider community of making sure that we keep our town centre vibrant. Yeah, but I don't necessarily think parking is the reason for that. Like parking doesn't necessarily make everything vibrant. Parking just turns no. over, you know, spots for people to you know park closer to their businesses. Um, a town centre refresh would do that to keep it vibrant and keep it updated and modern. Um, and it feels a little bit um, backwards in the sense that we're doing these parking things now, and I know that there's a town centre refresh potentially coming up. So we're going to make all these changes and then potentially have a layout that's different in the future. So, yeah, it's, it seems a little bit weird to me. Um, but, yeah, I, I sort of don't think that parking is actually going to make anything, change anything in terms of that vibrancy. Thank you. Let's open it for questions. Councillor Ford. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Um, wanted to just pick up on your uh, comments about the pre-engagement process mm -hmm. and um, can you give us some examples of things that you're disappointed about that haven't sort of come through, that came in, came up in the pre-engagement process, but um, in your view, uh, we haven't sort of carried through to the main consultation? Yeah, I feel a little bit cheeky because I was part of that pre-engagement process, but um, uh, we saw lots of comments coming in about the challenges that people face living in Manawatu, um, you know, the social aspects of it as well, you know, and particularly for those that are from ethnic minorities. And I don't feel as though this actually covers a lot of their concerns. And to be honest, like, the issues that have been put forward, they're not going to make a tangible difference to the majority of residents within the district, let alone within fielding. Um, you know, the Avery's, yeah, I can see that that can be a little bit of a hot button issue and parking as well. But like I say, it's it's not going to make that day-to-day -day difference for a lot of people. Um, it would have been nice to see some more big picture thinking and big picture focus in some of the things that were coming through. Um, that would have made a difference to people's lives. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for Ben? No? Thanks, Ben. Thank you for your submission and for making time to come today. No worries. Appreciate Thank you very much. it. Cheers. Okay, next up, uh, welcome, Christy. Come and join us. Uh, we're on page 27. Um, welcome, Christy. We have your, we've read your written submission. Uh, you're welcome to speak to it, and then there may be the odd question. Thank you. Sure. Um, I want to speak to two things today. I want to speak to the Averys, and I want to speak to the eight to the parking. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with the Averys. Um, I'm a uh, an educator. I work as an Enviro Schools educator now, and the loss of the Averys is huge. When we've got, I'm not saying that a huge amount of money spent on them is equally not huge. What I'm saying, though, is that if we take the Averys away from this community, you're forcing people in this community to go and shop and do all of their work in Palmerston. And I thought the idea of community was being able to provide opportunities. And if I don't have a car and I don't have transport, then I don't actually have access to those opportunities when you remove them from the community. So if you remove Averys, you remove things like that, then it impacts the lower socioeconomic um, section of our community and that concerns me secondly the parking I'm disabled although today I'm having a good day I walk really well some days I, I struggle to stand up out of a chair okay um, I have a stepson that's in a wheelchair if you put time limits on parking like you have you make it so that I no longer can shop in fielding I now go to Palmerston to shop. So my money is now no longer spent in this community, which I really want to do. But if I have to go back every half hour or every 40 minutes or every hour to move a vehicle, where getting in and out of a vehicle is debilitating. If you're in a wheelchair and you have to get in and out of a vehicle in a wheelchair, if you're in town for four hours, if you're parking further away, some of that limits me from being able to go to some of the shops that I want to go to because some days I just can't walk that far. Mm -hmm. Backing on top of the fact that there is very limited disabled parking around fielding, 
if you actually go and have a look at the parks and where they are, it's very hard to be able to find a disabled access car park. And I just want those things to be taken into consideration because it limits me to participate in my community as a disabled person. Thank you. Thank you for those um, key points. Um, so your point around disabled parking, um, not that there's any intention to put time enforcement on those, your point there is that we don't have enough of them? You don't have enough. And if there's a, if there's a time, so when I'm looking online and I'm looking at the, the zones and everything, mm. where does it say that the disabled parking is not timed? Well, the disabled parking is is not time, will not be timed, but, but it where was does about, it say that? Yep. Yeah, so it's a very, it's a good point. How, how do you. I know that? And if I'm not from Fielding and I'm not watching it, and right. I'm coming in from out of town and I am a disabled person, how do I know that? How do I know that it's not timed? And then there's just not enough disabled parks. Yep. If you go around town at any time and have a look at the amount of disabled parking signs that are in the front of cars that are in conventional car parks, mm -hmm. because you cannot find a disabled car park. There is not enough. And as our population is growing older, there is more people needing mm. that closeness of parking, which just makes me wonder why we're even going down this route in the first place. We want a town that our participants can participate in, not limit them from. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ford. Yeah, thank you. Um, would you be able to suggest, not necessarily now, but some stage uh, where you would recommend having some additional disabled car parks, please, because the, there's a number of varying views that people don't all, dis all, all agree with you. Some people think there's far too many. Yeah. Um, but I think it would be really useful for somebody who, um, that it's an important issue too, to perhaps give us some guidance as to your views on where, where some additional disabled parks could be. More than happy to. And um, I take your point that, um, yes, we, we know that there's no time limits on them, but um, how does anyone else know? Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, online is Councillor Short. Hi, Christy, thank you uh, for your submission. Um, there's been quite a bit of feedback on um, the, the mobility access parking, um, that there isn't enough and they're not in the right places. Um, it hasn't helped council that over the years the post office keeps moving um, and hopefully when the temporary library moves back over into the new community hub that will free up a bit more space there. Uh, one comment I will make is if we have an enforcement officer they will be checking that the people that are parked in a mobility park um, have the permit and they can be ticketed if it's uh, if they don't have a permit on display. So, so that should be one win for those with mobility cards. Thank you. Uh, anything further? No? Um, thank you, Christy. Can I just reply to Councillor? Absolutely, sure. So, because I go around a lot and I'm always looking for who's parking on a mobility that's not supposed to be there. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time people are actually holding tickets, cards, mobility cards, to be able to park in those spots. It is very rare to see people parking in them that don't have them. So I don't actually think that is so much of an issue in regards to there is just not enough. Yeah, so that backs up your view, there isn't enough. Yeah. yeah. And I think Councillor Ford's comment about, you know, if you were willing to, to as someone who uses those parks, to um, suggest where we may need to increase those, that could be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank the, you. The amount of, if you're thinking if you're in a wheelchair, for example, mm hmm and you have to get in and out of a of a if you look at the city grids and yeah. you look at where the parks are there's not enough there's so the sort of condensed here but there's not enough on all the other streets if that yeah. makes sense yeah. you know spread around yeah, yeah. okay but, thank you um thank you for your time thanks for coming today have a good day thank you. right uh, uh welcome to Janice Janice come and join us Perfect timing. So thank you for your submission, um, which we have read. You're welcome to speak to it, and then there may be some questions. Okay. Firstly, the biggest beef I have is you're going to go forward planning. Um, is the corner of Grey Street and Church Street, the traffic issues, 
the massive amount of trucks that have increased over the last few years, they um, having been told it's supplying supermarkets and the businesses and fielding is a load of, I have followed trucks deliberately and they go straight through. Okay, um, now you're putting up our rates, which I don't have an issue with. I do have an issue if we have road problems and these trucks must be paying user charges to somebody. Now, if they're coming down through Halcombe, through Church Street, barreling through town, um, why is the ratepayer being stuck with these with these repairs? Um, I'm. If you you have to, I, I would ask that the council actually could put a camera or something there and just monitor how many trucks are coming through. Now it has been said that um, they're coming through the back way to miss the way station at Ohakia. And with the new one, which is half built, they'll probably be doing going back the same way to miss it, going back the other way. Um, came back from Auckland a couple of weeks ago, Hubbard's 11 at night, and you would not believe what was going through town. Mm. Empty cattle yeah. trucks, the um, massive long, um, massive haul trucks, you know, all they're all doubles. Now, when one of them parks in um, Church Street and another one's coming the other way, there is just no way traffic can move at all. Um, and the other weekend, five o'clock Sunday morning, one's parked outside the bedroom. Um, it was a chemical truck, nothing to do with fielding. In the morning, there was a mess on the road outside where it had parked. Um, it's just got worse in the years that we've been here. So I want to know what are you doing about it to stop the trucks coming through. If they're for fielding, that's fine. But they're not. They're going past fielding. And I can't see why. Anyway, most of them can't come down the main road. Um, you have to live. You have to live here to know what it's like. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, have you noticed a difference since the roundabout construction work um, has been completed at Ohakia? Because, um, you know, we would perhaps suggest that some of those heavy trucks were missing all the road works, but now that the roundabout's open, though, though there's still a little bit of work there, have you noticed a reduction in the number of trucks? No? no just carries on. Not what's coming through. No. no. Okay. And they're trucking through at night. It's just, yeah. The other thing is I have asked for previously is something to do with, you know, some help with the speed in Church Street. Now I've been told that you can't put a roundabout in because of railway land or the rails, New Zealand rail land. Uh, we don't have street lights here, which is fine. Um, but why can't a speed camera be put in? I mean, the other morning I walked past one in um, West Street. So what's wrong with Church Street? It is a racetrack. Mm. Um, and quite honestly, if you're going to forward plane, you've got to slow that traffic down. Um, that brings me to the next point is the corner and the bridge, the crossing from Gray Street into Beatty. I think it's yep. Beatty on the other side. The amount of accidents on that corner. And there is just nothing slowing it down. And in the years I've been here, not one thing has been done. And yet I've been to the council on more than one occasion. Um, it concerns me that you've got two stupid orange discs painted on the pedestrian crossing, and I've seen cars miss children by very little. And one day it's going to be, instead of us picking up parts of cars out there, we'll be picking up part of a child. Um, is there any reason why this council can't have a crossing light? It's not a street light, but it is a warning light to everybody that are children on that crossing. Most children are there without a parent. I mean, that's not good anyway to start with. Right, that's that bit. The next thing, you sent out notices for speed bumps in Grey Street. Now, I have been told that most of Grey Street voted against it. I would suggest that the council looks at from your offices to the railway line, putting speed bumps in that section of Grey Street. Uh, most of the neighbours I've talked to have uh, all an agreeance to slow down the traffic going through that into that intersection. Is there anything on the plan to do something? 
Okay, and um, what part of Grey Street were you talking about? The, the whole of Grey Street? From here down to the railway line. Yep. That is, it's an absolute race track. They built over the over the railway line and motor, and everybody is trying to get through a six inch gap to get, through, you know, across. To me, quite, oops, personally, I would shut the, the um, shut it down. I think that's the only way to deal with it. The traffic can go another way. Most of the people racing through there do not live in Grey Street. Mm. Um, had to be rebuild the fence once, and I've been told by the council, your problem. I don't want to do it again at my cost. And I've asked even um, some sort of barrier on the corner, and it's no. Um, signage is incorrect. Um, it was only recently, I gather you get all the reports, a car went across, went straight through the stop sign, a sign and bowled a car and trapped a woman inside it. Um, just nothing is being done. Um, I understand, I've been told by someone else, even trucks are going through Bowen Street, just up here. Um, the, it doesn't make sense what's happening. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing those to our attention. Um, any questions from our team for Janice? Councillor yeah. Ford. Um, yeah, just wanted to clarify the... You've talked about accidents, um, but you also mentioned that the cars are going over to Beatty Street. Is, but just I just want to clarify that you are talking about the Grey, St Grey Street... Church Street intersection oh, is yes. the is the problem. Down here, it's not over the railway line. No, at, but it, at everybody Street. races across that. Now you've got on coming this way in Grey Street, it's give way. On the other way, it's a stop sign. Nobody reads them at all. Mm -hmm. There is constant accidents. And the other thing that doesn't help is the parking. And may I say it that there's a lot of council parking in Grey Street. Um, the church um, when it has <laughs> funerals. There is an issue with parking. There was an accident there two weeks ago. Was it three weeks? Um, there was a funeral on. They actually just put the hearse in the coffin into the hearse and there was a prank right on that corner. Um, what, what's your suggested solution? Close off the um, the road over the railway line like you've done down in, is it Camden Street? Yep. Yep, close it off and just see what happens to the traffic. It is a shortcut. It's not people that live there. And it is a residential street. Um, but it's just it's just stupid. It's just a matter of time that somebody's going to be killed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Um, thank you, Janice. Um, certainly hear your concerns. And um, we've made notes with that. Um, as part of our deliberations, um, when we go through these, we will come back to, to you with some of those um, answers to your questions. Well, and I, I'd, I'd hope, because this is coming up nearly five years and not a thing's been done. Right. And um, we do go out and sweep the street. We do pick up parts, put it on the footpath. We, yeah, we look after people sitting out there. And it's not our job. I don't mind doing it. It's not our job. But in, in nearly five years of me saying something, nothing has been done. Thank you, we hear you. So um, appreciate appreciate your submission. Thank you for coming today. That's um, okay. And thank you for caring. Oh, I do. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Right, we we will take a break now for morning tea. We are still waiting for a couple of submitters um, to be present. So if you could please be back here at 25 past to resume. Thank you.
Right, thank you. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. We're on page 36 and welcome up Christina and Charlene. Come and join us at the table. Thank you both for your submissions. Uh, I'm only here, uh, I got a question asked to me, what does the town prefer work for me? And I went, oh, pick up our rubbish, which they do, you're a good job of that. But I said, there's a but there though. Because I've heard that we're going to change from plastic to whatever, so i like to know what's the other part. We're going to change to, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, that's about it. But then uh, they asked me about the aviaries. Oh, we're free the birds. I don't know how further you can go to. Yeah, I don't. Thank you. Um, thank you. Hi, Kilda, Mayor, Councillors. My name is Charlene Simeon. I'm here on behalf of my sister's submission, Anikapina Hamilna. Um, from what I understand, her submission was about more taonga around the town due to the being none um, and, to, and the renaming of Kitchen of Park due to its original name being Tapatapata Native Reserve. He's actually a taonga of him sitting in our, in our park now that one of the whanau had put here a few years ago. He's no longer with us. And um, yeah, about more Tonga around the town, and our tūpuna is Māti Kaupata being recognised because they aren't here in the town, and they are an important part of this town's history, being the founders here and introducing you to our family. So I think it's very important that our town represent our tūpuna of Ngāti Kauwhata, our rangatira, there are seven major ones, and they have never been acknowledged on their land. And that's what I'm... Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, a question, you talk about... Um, opportunities to recognise um, marais and iwi in our community. What Have you got any ideas of what that might look like? You've talked about um, Kitchener Park and the, the name, but in the rest of our community and district, um, maybe in the town centre, do you have any ideas um, about what that might look like? I do, actually. After returning from Australia and hopping on a bus in Auckland, travelling down the country, back to Fielding, um, the Tonga and Tainui, all the tūpuna standing on the side of the road as you enter the rohi of Tainui, mm -hmm. that. I'd like our tūpuna to be the same here on our whenua. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's open it up for any questions, please. Councillor Ford. Um, delighted to hear of your request. Um, Mayor Helen and I were in a previous life were involved in an organisation called Fielding Promotion, and we um, were, we were very keen to have uh, Tanga represented throughout the town, district, etc. So, um, really, just adding to Mayor Helen's question, I'd love to get some suggestions and um, actually get on with it because we've also got a, uh, a town centre refresh pro project coming up, future of Fielding. And um, what you're suggesting is just perfect for what we're looking to do. So um, please don't be backward and forward. In coming forward, we, we absolutely welcome your um, recommendations, suggestions. Thank you. Uh, nothing further. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, support that. Develop those ideas. Come up with some ideas of what that might look like and where we might put put them um, and the timing's really good for that. So thank you for coming today and taking the time to talk to us. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you.
Okay, let's move to page 48 and Gary. Gary, come and join us at the table. Thank you for coming along. We're on page 48. So we have your submission, and which we have read. You're welcome to speak to it, and then there may be some questions. Not too many questions. <laughs> just, just a few um, difficult ones. Thank you. There you go, Gary, just so you can be heard. Thank you, Grant. Um, in regards to the bird aviary, in 2018, I supported the campaign to remove the native bird aviaries as the birds had limited area to fly in and the surroundings were out of character. There was some opposition in the time. The public realised that the best results was to remove the birds and aviaries, similar to the exotic bird aviaries. They have had their value and time and the cost of retaining them outweighs the value of the project to keep them. Yesterday morning, I visited the exotic bird aviary at the Palmerston North Esplanade and spoke to a volunteer who was cleaning the floor of one of the enclosures. She informed me that there were three permanent staff at the wildlife base and also take care of the exotic birds as well. All the birds have rings on their legs and are monitored each day for their health and welfare. The staff working there, working there are professional in their approach and the aviaries are very well maintained. The lady I talked to had spoken to the Manitou District Council some time ago about the disgraceful exotic bird aviaries in Kofi Park in Fielding. On my return to Fielding, I once again visited Kofi Park and was appalled at the condition the exotic bird aviaries were in. The Manawatu District Council has a responsibility to spend ratepayers' money wisely on projects that supports the exotic bird aviaries are questionable. Supporters of the aviaries have not taken into consideration of the cost of building the new aviaries and the continual expense on the upkeep and looking after the birds. Therefore, I, along with, I and along with a few of the councillors support the removal of the aviaries and develop the area into display gardens. Thank you. That's, that's your submission and comments. Um, thank you for that. Any questions of Gary, please? Councillor Underwood. Morning. Morning. Um, a previous submitter had an opposing view um, due to the fact that they're regular visitors to the Averys and said that if they're going to go to Palmerston North to visit the Averys there, they would possibly do all their shopping there as well to, you know, save another trip to town. Do you think that could be an issue? Would that be one out of 30,000? I don't know. Well, you're telling me. <laughs> no, just asking you if you think. No, it no, could be not at all. Huh? No, the bird, the birds down there and the aviaries are in a terrible condition. Have you seen them lately? I have. Have you seen where the doves are? No. It's shocking. The aviaries in Palmerston North, they can see the native birds. They can do a tour around the uh, wild base area, and then have a look at the uh, exotic birds. There's a paddling pool there. There's a restaurant. There's a train. There's so many different things. And it only takes 20 minutes to get there. So why double up and have the cost of, of these birds here and uh, the birds over in Palmerston North? So I take that your answer is no, you don't think it'll be a problem? No. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions of Gary? No. No. Um, so, Gary, thank you for your submission. Thank you for coming today and highlighting um, your points. The, we've taken those on board and they will be part of our deliberations and we will come back to you once we've made our decisions. 
I've got another submission. You've got another submission? Great. We Let's... don't get off that hard. Pardon? <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. Carry on. Um, in regards to the parking in the CD, um, CBD, the parking in the CBD is a concern for all the re retailers and residents in the Fielding District, and the cost of the enforcing time limits should be shared by all. Further restrictions should be enforced where parking is causing a problem, especially surrounding the Manawatu District Council office. According to my information, the parking signage contract could have been put up for tender, allowing a fair price to be forwarded. A local signage company would then have had the opportunity to submit a price. There have been over 120 parking signs installed in the CBD so far, with the initial cost of $188,000, this e equals to each sign being installed at a cost of $1,510. Some companies in the CBD have not adhered to the signage and many residents are voicing opinions on the social media. The parking limits will eventually be obeyed and the majority will be happy. Thank you. That's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Um, thank you. And just re um, just confirming, your view was that the the annual cost for parking enforcement should be shared by all. By all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my moans or submissions. Wouldn't Thank have missed it for the world. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Appreciate the time that you take. Uh, right, let's go to page 47 to the Avicultural Society. Graham, good morning. Come and join us. You've been patiently waiting. Is this microphone on? Yeah. If it's green, yes, it's on. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Your Worship. Good morning, Councillors. My name's Graham Dejou. Um, I'm a rate power of uh, fielding. My submission today is the uh, saving of the bird cages in Kowai Park. Um, our proposal, I'm a member of the um, Agriculture Society Bird Club of Fielding. And our proposal is to um, take over the running of the bird um, aviaries. The birds down there at the moment are in a shocking condition. If we had birds at home in that condition and an SPCA member came through, we'd be closed down. Um, and if we had birds in the condition down there, we would just take them away and bring them back to health. Um, the reason why they're in that condition is they've got nothing to do. All they do is run from perch to perch and nothing. So what we were proposing is um, upgrading the whole lot, present it to the public in a condition that looks nice. Um, and it wasn't going to cost the council any money at all to maintain those aviaries. We'd take all the costs, all the running of it, um, the whole nine yards. So at this stage, the council wouldn't have to put up any money, which you haven't got. Um, and if we worried about how much we spend on our birds at home, uh, we wouldn't do it. Um, I've got over 200 birds at home, and it doesn't cost me 151,000 to feed them a year. Um, so that's that point, um, and the other side of it is we'd like to, if we took over the bird cages in Kowai Park, we would like to shift our meeting place once a month, uh, we have a Sunday once a month, um, to the Cricket Pavilion right opposite. At the moment we've got a meeting place at the Manchester House, um, I know there's asbestos in the aviaries, but if you touch it now, 
going to cost a lot of money to get rid of it. It's all got to be done up in plastic. It's got to go to special dump sites, and that's where the money's going to cost you. So if we can um, paint the rest of it, put a backing on the back wall, and not disturb it, it's fine. Um, I'm a builder by trade, a fire engineer by trade, so I know what I'm talking about. My time in um, agriculture has been over 50 years. I do conference talks to um, bird um, clubs in Australia and here in New Zealand, so I know what I'm talking about. A lot of people that I know that I talk to know nothing. Um, I was talking to a lady here the other day, told me I'd have to have a zoo licence to take over the aviaries. The Avery's in um, Wanganui are taken over by a bird club. Um, the ones over in Dannyburg are taken over by a bird club. And I can't see what the problem would be if we took the ones over here, set it up to what it should look like, not what it's like now, um, and we'd do all the um, costs and what we have to do. And then we can also get back and let you know what's happening and what's going on. So that's my view. Thank you. Um, thanks, Graham. Let's open it up for questions. Anyone um, have questions for Graham? Councillor Blackmore. Thank you. Graham, I'm just curious, you talk about um, setting the current bird aviaries up to what they should be. Right. What do you mean by that? Well, at the moment, um, we wouldn't have a dirt floor in it. Um, we'd put a lime rock on the bottom and then all the droppings go through the lime rock. So when you come up and look at the aviary, it doesn't look like it needs a rake out. So it looks nice and neat. Um, we'd put um, a rose in each one. A, um, they attract the aphids. So that gives the birds food or something to jump around it. So they would be a lot better looked after than what they are now. And it's not a, a business, it's a hobby. So when it becomes a hobby, they get looked after. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Quarry. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming along this morning. I know, I think it was six years ago, there was a proposal to close the Averys and there was such a hue and cry that... Um, uh, we we really couldn't close them, and the proposal then was to work in with the bird society. Now that never eventuated. Um, somewhat disappointing. Um, you say there's there's the opportunity of working with your society and working with council to to try and upgrade and and um, maintain and and run the facility. Yep. They do that in Australia. I can't see why we do. And the other the other thing that um, we'd like. Um, to put forward too, that DOC don't get involved and the SPCA. DOC want to get rid of everything that's in the country in the way of birds. SPCA are only volunteers. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, so, yeah, a good example for um, DOC is I got a, um, a native bird licence, which I'm allowed to Kākarikis. We bred a few kākarikis, um, and because we had about a dozen, Doc turned up and wanted to know where the permit was for the rest. And we said, well, we bred them. Well, we said, you can't have that many. So they took them away, and we had no leg to stand on. So I don't know. I don't like dealing with those people. Um, at, my, at my stage, I don't think they know what they're doing. Um, and I deal with a lot of Australians and um, I've got vets over there that if I have any problems with my birds, I ring a vet in Australia because we've got no bird vets here that can tell you what's wrong with them. They give you a big bottle or something about this high and the bird's dead the next day. So, yeah. So in saying what we're trying to do is... We do it on a professional side. Um, we don't like to see animals suffer. 
and I can guarantee you they won't. And it's going to save you a lot of money. It's not going to cost you anything. So um, it, that's my point. And you would maintain the operational cost? They would be part of... Yep. We've got sponsors out there ready to go. Thank you. Councillor Ford. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Um, one of the issues that we've, that's been brought to our attention has been the um, somewhat shaded position with the trees, etc. What's your, your view on well, that? Well, that would be something I'd ask the Council, seeing that your trees, um, we don't want to be seen chopping trees down. Um, and if they could have a look and just cut the ones down that are shaded in the ovaries. Right, so your view is they shouldn't be uh, shaded? No. Thanks. Councillor Belsky. Um, yeah, hi, thank you for coming today. Um, it's, it's a huge um, offer that you're offering us. Um, and um, I'm just thinking about uh, the longer term. When, when you go, is there, is there a good young um, people coming on that will take this vision on and and offering to pay for all the food and everything's a it's a huge offer. So um, you know how do we how do we know that we we you know it's only a temporary thing and then you disappear? We've we've had quite a few examples of people wanting to say this and that, and that generation does, but the next generation hasn't got the same. Interest, We'd like so. to go and do a contract with the council, write up a, a contract, um, whatever it takes. Um, and the reason why I say it's not going to cost anything to the council is that the bird side will put their birds in, into one of the cages, right? We don't expect the council to pay for them, to look after them. If the, whoever puts their birds into one aviary, they look after that aviary. Okay. Councillor McFadden. Thank you, Worship. In, in principle, you would be open to something like the council saying we will lease you the aviaries for a dollar a year and gift you the birds. Yep. So then the so that then we're um, got yeah. a contract. Yeah, no, thank you. We don't want any unforeseen yeah. um, surprises coming up around the corner. Um, so well, when you say um, it's a generous offer, when you say at no cost to the council, what about the cost to upgrade the existing aviaries? We'll, that... do, that. we'll do that. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> we know what we want and how it should be done. So, yep. Councillor Quarry. How big is your society? How many members do you have? Uh, probably about 30, 35 local, and then we've got about another 30 or 40 outside Wanganui. Um, we've got some over in Danny Virk, Levin, all over. And, and you mentioned two councils, well, two other, um, shall we say, privately run aviaries. Are there any others that you know of? No, but they had a lot of problems with the Wanganui one, trying to close that down. And one of the, the bird up, um, cage people up there took it over, and they're all running it now, just like the Denny Boot one. So they're the only ones I know of. Um, and the one in Palmerston, Peter Russell used to run that. And then when he got taken out, um, because the people who were looking after the birds didn't have a, um, a native bird licence, they got rid of all the native stuff. So really, at the end of the day, you know, we sometimes we're banging our heads. A final question. If I may. Thank you. Um, would there be a possibility of native birds coming back then? Um, a possibility. We've got licences for those. You've got licences for them. Yeah. Okay. People, it's, it's a bit like um, when you sit home and look at a fish tank. And you can feel everything sort of coming out of you when you're just when you're stressed. It's like that when you go down to the parks, and you sit there and look at the birds flying around, and you think, well, they've got no problems, you know. And you're sitting there in the chair watching the ducks and all that sort of thing. So I think it'll be a, a good opportunity um, to go from there. 
Thank you. You you talked about other places where the local um, agricultural group look after them. My understanding in the Whanganui long term plan is is they are proposing to get rid of their aviaries as well. Oh yeah. Um, well, I know the guys that are taking over that already that are looking after the birds. Um, depend on how long term they've got up there, but we can go for as long as you like. And we seem to think that we will attract a lot more members to our club by, feed it, by feeding the birds. And my proposal was to um, the headmaster at the Fielding High School to set up an agricultural um, group that likes to look after agriculture. Doesn't have to be what we do, but at least they get a hands on. Yeah. So it could be quite a viable thing. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for your submission. Um, and also thank you for the offer that you've put to council, which is something that um, we will certainly have a look at and consider. Um, and have a look at that in some detail. And when we've made um, our decisions around deliberations, we will come back to you. Um, but if there's any any other information that you think in the meantime would be helpful, we'd appreciate it. Very good. Thanks for your time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so at the moment our speakers um, sit down to speak. We don't have any current uh, present at the moment. Um, any of any of our friends in the public gallery, have you got submissions coming up today that you may wish to talk to us about now, or are you waiting for others to join you? No, you're observing. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you. So um, we will have to take a break until our next submitters um, arrive. So uh, let's do that. Thank you.
Right, team, welcome back. And we will carry on with our submitters. Uh, we're on page 50. And welcome to Donna and Craig. Come and join us up at the table. And... Um, Crikey, that was fast. We weren't expecting to be up here so quickly. <laughs> oh, that's great to know. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you for your submission. We have read your written submission. Looking forward to hearing you talk about the highlights from it, and then there may be some questions. Absolutely. Yep. Good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you very much for the opportunity for us to sit here and talk to you about um, Halcombe Stormwater. We're Donna and Craig Matthews. We live at 152 Tokarangi Road um, in Halkham. Um, we have been there since 2007. Um, we've also been ratepayers in the Manitou district for more, more than 40 years. Yes. Um, yes. yes, the reason that we are here today is because we have issues with the stormwater um, coming through our property um, in Halkham. Okay. So the best way we thought we could show you how this is impacting us and affecting us is um, through a pictorial um, PowerPoint, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Is there anything you want to add? Have I forgotten anything? No. Oh, the, the reason that we are actually sitting in front of you guys is we're out of our comfort zone doing this, so it's not our usual gen. Um, we're more comfortable with sheep and cows and that kind of thing. Um, we also, it is purely out of frustration that we're here in front of you today. So I that. Thank hope you. that I can get this working. Yes. Okay, so this is an aerial photograph of our property um, taken in 2008. Um, the red lines are actually the fence lines um, back in 2008. Please be aware that this is after the big floods in 2004. The blue asterisk at the bottom is a gate. And the yellow line is the distance between the fence line and the creek edge. Mm -hmm. um, Ash might be able to help you there. Yeah, help somebody. Yep, there we go. Oops. All right, there we go. Oh, my goodness, it's a bit slow. <laughs> Sorry, people. <laughs> Ta-da, I found it. <laughs> well, moving, on to <laughs> moving on to 2022, this is... If you look at the blue asterisks in the top left-hand corner, that's the gate we had pointed out in the first slide. Um, as you see, we call this now our gate to nowhere. The okay. subsidence is significant. So this we, we are unable to get any access or tractor or motorbike or anything um, through that side now. Um, these are our gorgeous grandchildren. Um, this was taken in 2012. Um, the, the happily sailing boats that we made for them. This whole ledge has now gone, so there's nothing there. So from the red line back, that has all been washed away and eroded. Um, we have culverts a little bit further down from there that um, are just sitting with nothing beside them because the water's pretty much um, eroded both sides. So they're, they're, they're useless. Um, this is my gorgeous husband a few years ago, quite a few years ago. Um, this is part of one of the paddocks that um, the stormwater system runs down. As you can see, we have um, tractor access, quad access, and um, obviously walking access, and we can put stock through this area as well. And that was in 2013. Sorry, which one was your husband? <laughs> <laughs> I've only ever had one. <laughs> and, he's and he's enough. He's... Um, so we wanted to actually show you how lovely our place used to look. Um, the red line is the tractor access you just saw in the, pre in the previous slide. Um, and just for clarity, this was taken um, 20 metres back and 10 metres to the right from the previous image. Mm -hmm. 
Moving on to 2021, um, this is completely self-explanatory. This is the area that we were looking at in the last slide and the slide before where Craig was walking. Um, the left of the red line shows where the banks used to be. Um, this is absolutely unacceptable, guys. This is not stormwater neutral at all. Uh, moving on to 2022, the tractor access, the quad bike access is now foot access only. And we can't, we can only get, you know, run our sheep and cows down there if we're, if we're lucky. Um, so this is further erosion and further subsidence. What you see here is common practice for us. Um, this is contamination from stormwater runoff from up in the subdivisions. Um, our property now takes the water from the east side of um, Halcom and the south side of Halcom, so both sides of the railway lines. At some point, um, there was an additional culvert put in Tokarangi Road to take the water from um, the south side and redivert it through our property. Um, I know that you it is absolutely a no-no to um, redirect the natural course of the water. So we still need to go through and investigate how this has happened, why it has happened, and why Craig and I are now in this situation. Um, that's there. Oh, so this is actually runs behind our house, this um, this section. And it used to be probably half a metre deep. Um, now it is way over my head. And we would hate for anybody to actually fall in there when the water's pouring down um, this supposedly private drain. Um, oops, sorry, just back here. Um, this is further contamination. As you can see, it's all milky from activities that are way up on the top of Hastings Street and um, up areas quite a few distance from our property. <clears throat> This is our main access um, route over our rated bridge of 30 tonne. Um, our business has relied on this access to allow stock fertiliser and um, spray trucks up to the yards and to um, our loading race. This is um, a video, I'm not sure if it's actually going to work. Um, oh yes, here we go. And this is the water that also become, comes past our house. Come on guys, you have to do something about this is not good enough. So this instance is not considered a 5, 10, 20, 50 or 100 year flood. This is just normal for what Craig and I have to put up with at times after four or five days rain. Um, and it's what it looks like on a regular basis. This is not stormwater neutral. Sorry guys, I'm not sure what's happened there. So um, in 2021, we started really looking at our bridge and we thought, oh my goodness, with all of the stormwater going through, um, it's actually started to delaminate the layers on our bridge. Um, and that's as a result of um, continuous impact of the stormwater. And um, at this point of time, we thought, crikey, we better get this looked at. So we had an engineer come and have a look, and he derated our bridge from 30 tonne to 10 tonne. Um, so this, in effect, stopped our business from working. We couldn't get stock trucks or trucks over this bridge anymore to um, um, take stock away or... Yeah, anything. So I know you guys get the picture. Mm. So as depicted in the um, video, the water is forced through the top right hand side and has completely undermined the concrete piles. That is what the underside of the bridge looks like now. And this is after years of being just um, hammered by water that's come down. In 2021, we actually came to council and we said, 
we've got an issue here, guys. Um, we need you, we really need you to look at it because with the subdivisions and building consents that have been granted, um, Craig and I believe that we have been impacted a lot more since then. Um, you know, with the loss of um, hard surfaces, um, lots of sheds laying up with no water catchment, um, people putting in tanks that are way too small for their houses, people out there that don't even have a tank and rely on the Halcom Water Scheme to, um, you know, feed their property. That's not good water management. We should be all looking at how we can, um, you know, conserve water and prevent things like this from happening. So the creek that you're looking at there once took um, several days to become full. Now, in moderate rain, it fills in one and a half days. Um, and over the last three years, the creek has not um, dried out, with the exception, funnily enough, of March this year. Um, and that, the only reason it's dried out is because there's been little or no rain. However, we do have some in the bottom again already, Craig, don't we, from, from, from last night and the night before. Our bridge was not designed to take the volumes of water that had been forced through our property. Um, it is not acceptable that no consultation or inspection or modelling of the stormwater infrastructure was undertaken before the land development strategy out at Halcombe um, was implemented. So we've had... Um, several more houses go up. Craig and I love this community, it's great, and we, we are all for growth. However, um, you guys have been remiss in making sure that the infrastructure can actually cope with the growth. Um, the trees that are currently holding our banks together are being undermined. Um, a lot of the original trees we had on the property um, had been destroyed. Um, plantings of native trees and flaxes that we, we had put on um, to try and help preserve the banks and beautify the creek itself have all gone. So we haven't, um, we have not, we have since then not planted anything else. So in summary, um, this has cost us a lot of money. Um, you guys have neglected to undertake any investigations prior to getting approval for subdivisions and building consents of the whole stormwater system. Um, why has zero modelling not been undertaken? Um, when are we going to get some resolution at Halcombe for the stormwater? Um, we will continue to raise this until something is, until the damage to our property is stopped. Is there anything else you want to add, Craig? No, I think it's Donna's dead right. Uh, we both have the same opinion. It has to be. It's not a. It's not a climate change issue or anything like that. It's a. The what amount part of water of coming down that creek has increased in volume tenfold to what it was when we first moved in there, and uh, it, it's wearing away the banks. It's it's just because it's a lot of silty silty ground there. Mm. It's just tearing it away. It's tearing it into the banks, and uh, we can't stop it. We need you guys to do something. Thank you very much, Mayor and Councillors, for listening to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the effort that you've gone to putting the video together, because that really helps understand the issue that you've got. Um, open it up for any questions of clarification from our team. Councillor Campbell. Yeah, hi, Donna. Stuart. Um, I, I think. Yes, yeah, we had discussions back in uh, yes. 2021. Yes. And um, uh, yeah, I did, um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not a stormwater engineer, but I did pass your concerns along to the operational team. Um, and it appears as though, uh, you know, you haven't had a satisfactory response. Um, uh, so, you know, we'll see what we can do, I guess, um, from, from the operational <laughs> side of things um, to. If there's anything to be done. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have had a lot of conversations with the um, technical team. Um, we have pretty much been fobbed off, which is not great. Um, I guess we feel like we've been in the too hard basket. Um, 
Mm. Yeah, so this is why we're here today. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Appreciate thank you. It. We've got a question online from Councillor Short. Hello, Councillor Short. Hi, guys. Sorry. Believe it or not, this week of all weeks, I've got COVID, so I'm online. <laughs> um, I've not been to your property, but I have been around uh, your neighbour Greg's property with him, and I've looked across the road. And in fact, my nephew lives across the road from you, but he's a little bit more elevated. So I certainly know the landscape that you're talking about and it's a very complex network of small streams that join together and they are the only exit for water coming out of the hollow of the village of Halcom for which all water runs down and um, I did take numerous photos when I was with Greg and came back to the operational team we were more looking on the other side of the road um, on Tokarangi Road over the bridge and it, then it gets complicated because the landowner is Kiwi Rail and they won't have a bar of it. So it's and it's an absolute mess over there with fallen down trees and gates and fences and all sorts. And um I'm really sorry that nothing has been addressed at this point because that was a couple of years ago when I had a look with Greg. Um that was as a result of what happened in the December 2021 event. But um I know there's a lot more um sections that are uh, going to be built on uh, closer to you. I mean, not even so much on the um, Hastings Street side, but on the other side, there's going to be some development on Willoughby Street. So I certainly hope, I hear you, and I certainly hope that our operational team can come up with some solution to reducing the volume of water that you're dealing with. Thank you, Councillor Short. We really appreciate that. Um, um, Yes, we understand um, your visit to Greg Brown. Um, one comment I would like to make about that is, unfortunately, um, there are two different sources. Greg's comes from up Stanway and uh, uh, up the top of Tokarangi Road. What comes through our property is directly from the Halcombe Village itself. So um, Craig and I don't pay stormwater rates, but everybody else pays stormwater rates. And... We don't pay them because you guys use our property to actually um, let stormwater through. Um, mm. We don't. We we we're okay with that, but not like it is now. So, um, you know, thanks, Councillor Short, for um, your support. And yes, Ryan's a lovely guy. He does live across the road. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Question from Councillor McFadden. Thank you. Um, I have raised that recently with our operational team, um, and. My understanding is is that the responsibility for the stream actually is Horizons because that comes under their bracket and they have raised the issue with Horizons and Horizons have said, we don't rate for it and we don't have a strategy for it, so it is not our problem. So we have, an, we have a bit of an impasse which we're going to have to find our way around, but we have not in the last few months been doing nothing. We're just not making, we need to come back to you to see what we can actually do. Yes, thank you for that. A representative from Horizons did come. Um, yeah. and excuse my language, but I'm going to tell you exactly what he, verbatim what he said. Yeah. Um, he's a drain guy. He's not a structural engineer, a civil engineer. Um, he's just a drain bloke. And he stood on our bridge and he said, oh, you've got shit concrete. Yeah. And that is absolute bollocks. So we understand your position but we become the meat in the sandwich because you guys want to develop Halcom, which is great, and we support that 100%. Um, we do not believe that another 30 sections and 30 houses is not going to have impact on us. We're already impacted mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. these. Um, yes, I know you're probably thinking, well, what attenuation measures we can have, um, we did say that to your technical guys, your operations team. What attenuation measures have you guys used? Well, it's stormwater neutral, Donna. Rubbish. You can see by what we have at our property that it is actually not the case. Thank you. Final question from Councillor McFadgen. Yeah, thank you. I also have discussed with the operational team saying that we're aware that the, of the planned subdivision. Do we have scope under our rules and our planning to take the cap, the cap of the contribution towards the asset contribution towards actually putting that money to fixing that stormwater issue, and it is an area that we are actually looking at. Thank <coughs> you. That, that would be great. Yeah, we, we would appreciate that. Um, 
So thank you to you both, to Donna and Craig. Thank you for being brave and coming to council today, because I know that's not an easy thing to do. Um, but thank you for the effort that you've put into the presentation, because that makes it loud and clear what the issue is. Um, and it sounds like there has been some conversations, et cetera, going on. Um, and so we need to be able to follow that up to see where else um, Manawatu District Council can assist and and where we may be able to help with horizons in this because it certainly has to be resolved. So, so um, appreciate all your time today. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, for, thanks, for thanks for having us. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day. We will. You too. We know you've got a big a lot on your plate. Okay, let's move to Volunteer Central. We're on page 54. Um, welcome, Kate and Chris. Welcome to the table. Good to see you again. Um, thank you for your written submission, which we have read. And uh, you're welcome to talk, speak to it, and then there may be some questions. Tēnā tato, um, I'm Kate Haplin. I'm the manager of Whatungatua Volunteer Central. And I'm Chris Atherton. I'm the chairman of the board at Volunteer Central too. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to look at the future for Manawatu District. And I'll pass over to Chris to um, talk to our submission that we assume you have all read. Oh, thank you. Um, we are, um, for those that don't know, Volunteer Central, we, we look at, we're a community organisation that look after um, volunteers and member organisations in across a number of districts, including Orofanua, Manawatu, Palmerston North, and Tararua. Um, the average age of uh, our volunteers is 47, and they range from 11 years of age to 98 years of age. So it's not it's not just old people; it's a big range of people. Um, we are heavily involved in the um, community sector, obviously, um, and I think one of our concerns with the, with the plan is there's, it, there seems to be a focus on infrastructure and, and not so much on the community side of things. Um, you'll hear a lot of organisations in the in the in our sector talk about uh, running on an oily rag, and we are no different to that. Uh, but we do cut our cloth to, to suit. Um, and I think Kate will talk a bit more about some detail. We work across a lot of member organisations and a lot of community organisations, and they do talk to us about some of the things that they possibly wouldn't talk to you guys about because you're their funder um, when they do talk to us. Um, I think we know that the councils are on a lot of fiscal pressure um, in terms of a lot of cost increases and, and of course, you know, cutting spending on community in the community area is an easy, is an easy win. Um, I think our focus, because we are a flexible, nimble organisation and we work across a lot of the community, um, one of the things that we really want to focus on is to um, be involved in a project in Manawatu to talk about, uh, to look at how that money is spent. Because I think one of the things that we see is there is duplication in that in the sector. And it's like if we can minimise the amount of duplication, then I think uh, you guys will get a better book bang for your buck and that's really what in you know, all our interest to do so um but you can give us a bit more detail about that kate thank you thanks chris um yes so we work with 160 member organizations and they range from rest homes through to visiting people in their own homes to being friends with people with disabilities to community gardens, um, conservation projects, cleaning up the environment with the plastic pollution challenge, um, dog walking, looking after Wild Base Recovery Centre with, with volunteers to look after the native birds um, and help them back to recovery so they can be released. Um, we work across all cultures, we work across all age groups, we work across no matter what people's abilities are, it doesn't matter what their education level is, it doesn't matter if they've just come out of prison, it doesn't matter if they're homeless or well-homed, we work with everybody across the whole community. And as Chris said, that means we get to see an awful lot of what's happening out in the community. And while there are great services available, with the pressure that councils are under at the moment, you really need to look at what is the best bang for your buck um, and for the community buck. And uh, 
paying services that are in competition with each other, um, rather than looking at how those services could work together and collaborate to to maximise the use of your community resource would be of benefit. And and we, as Chris said, would really like to work with with council around how can we actually um, help that to happen uh, because we have those existing relationships with organisations and we are Switzerland, they don't have contracts with us, they, they don't rely on us for funding, so we do hear a lot of things that perhaps others don't. Um, another uh, initiative that we're actually working on at the moment is around volunteer coordination for regional emergencies. Um, so I'm actually presenting to um, the community engagement group next week uh, on a proposal to look at um, having Volunteer Central as the volunteer coordination point for regional emergencies. And that's in, um, got the mandated support from our neighbouring volunteer centres from Whanganui and Ruapehu and also Waikato as well. So that's something that we're actually actively working on for this community as well. I'm happy, unless you've got anything else, Chris. Only that those organisations trust us as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, well, first of all, thank you for the, the great work that you do. Um, and it's fantastic, you know, too often you hear, oh, you can't get volunteers anymore. Nobody wants to do that, um, which I've never believed in. Um, if they've got the right cause and um, the right people driving it, and, you, you know, you're confirming that with the number of volunteers that you have and the work that you're involved with. Um, I'd be interested, um, outside of today, talking um, more about the duplication and how do we um, get the best bang for the buck that we have. Um, I'd be really keen to talk about that in a positive way, about yeah. how we can do that together. Um, any questions around the table for Volunteer Central? Councillor Underwood. Good morning. Um, with you saying that you hear things that probably others wouldn't because of your relationship or lack of relationship with these uh, um, places, what would be the most surprising thing that you've heard or something that you would think that we wouldn't be aware of? I'm, I'm not going to speak about any specific organisation or anything, but but we often um, come along to hearings and submissions and, and presentations, etc. And there's certainly information that might be stretching the reality a little bit that's presented to council rather than what the reality is. Are you, sorry, I go on. just to clarify that, are you saying the information that's given to council, that stretching reality, is given by? By some organisations. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, on a positive tone, there's always opportunity to see how we can all work better together yep. and, um, and reduce the amount of duplication where possible. Um, any other questions? Our team? No. Um, Councillor Ford. You probably should have cut me off, actually. <laughs> um, so I'd rather talk about the negative tone. Um, so are you saying that you'll kind of play Judas and um, tell us which organisations not to fund? Is that your offer? I, <laughs> I, I would suggest that it's it's an opportunity to look at where the funding goes for the best benefit for the community. Um, Thank you. That that could mean some changes for some organisations potentially. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and and you know and good on you for being upfront and honest because that's potentially a hard thing to put on the table. Who me or? Well, no. that too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thank you, Kate and Chris. Thank you for taking the time. But again, thank you for the work that you do in the community. Much thank you. And um, Alison, we look forward to seeing you at the volunteer recognition event on behalf of Mayor Helen. Yes, that will be another great, uh, um, great event that's just growing and growing.
Okay, uh, next up, welcome to the Rongatia Community Committee. We're on page 58. Welcome, Lance, and your team. You go. <laughs> Great to see you again. Um, thank you for your submission. We've read your written submission, and you're welcome to speak to this, and then there may be some questions. Um, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak and voice the concerns of Rongatia Village. We have put a submission through for the long-term plan to have a cycling walking track established on Banks Road. We would really appreciate it if the Manawatu District Council could see this approved as soon as possible rather than us having to wait for this to be approved as part of the long-term plan. As we currently have children walking and cycling on the edge of a 100k zone road. This is a safety issue. We have been lucky enough so far to have no one injured or killed. In the last few years, we've had around 24 homes built in the subdivisions on Florin Lane, Stirling Lane and Crown Lane, plus in three in close proximity to Banks Road. We would really appreciate the Manawatu District Council to see this as a huge safety issue and establish the walking and cycling track on Banks Road so that the children can get safely to and from the village without having to worry about spinning vehicles. Please also refer to the Rongatia School Submission 218, Troy Anderson. Thank you. Is there anything else either of you would like to add to that? Or are you going to take the hard questions? <laughs> uh, well, yes, so in the... Um... You have put out the submissions on the speed zones. It, it still is 100 k's through there. Um, you said, I think you chose 70 k's through there, and we're wondering if that is still too high. Um, it, there are like there are young families out there, and mm -hmm. so there are going to be more and more children. Um, and this, the, the next stage of the subdivision is coming too, so it'd be nice to incorporate that as well. Yeah, for safety of the future children of Rongatia, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's open it up. Any questions from our team, Councillor Quarry? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming along this morning. Um, you mentioned there's 27 new houses that have been built, I understand. How many more houses are there to be built? How many em empty sections are there? Unsure of that, sorry, Councillor. Sorry? Unsure of that, sorry. Have a, have a guess. Oh, I'm guessing there'd be probably at least 10 more empty sections. 10, 10 more empty sections. Yeah, because they haven't all developed on them yet. No. So, like, they've all been sold, but they've um, we're still they're developing their houses on them. Um, and then we've got that new subdivision that's still coming. There'd be, they're, they're talking 200 homes on there. So yeah, that's, that's sort of a separate issue. Yeah. But the um, the potential for going down Banks's line would be 27 plus another 10 or so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Councillor Ford? Yeah, thank you. Um, so how long is this uh, walkway? Who do you see paying? And what will cost approximately? Uh, be about 800 metres long. Um, be the council paying for it. Uh, the community committee have no funding, so um, but we don't have many options. So all we can do is ask that you uh, look after this for us. And the cost? No, nothing done yet at this stage, very early stages. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the question I had was, um, is there, do you believe that there is sufficient um, road reserve to allow a track to be built? Yes, there is. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. About three metres, so there's plenty there. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you for that. No further questions. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the passion that you have for Rongatia and have had for a long time. Um, so keep up the good work and thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
When we did the um, rongatea, Andrew showed. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think probably Alice and Fiona and I. Yeah, it's quite easy. I think it is quite easy. Mm. Right. Uh, thank you. Moving on, we are now on page 59. Um, and welcome, Angela. Come and join us at the table. Good to see you again. Thank you for your submission. Um, we have read it. You're welcome to speak to it, and then there may be some questions. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My whānau a tangata whenua and kaitiaki of our land. Through critical thinking and observation over many decades, along with learning and listening to those who have paved the way before us, has helped us to embrace Papatu and Nuku, Mother Earth. She has a presence and an authority that demands us to listen and to support her life cycles. Okay. Where do I oh, no. Where the modification is real, it's happening now without our consent, discreetly called experimental under the science framework. Under the, and, and the result we are seeing is what we call climate change and the extremes that we are seeing. On the left hand side here, the two on the top hand is um, Dubai's uh, weather centre. Those are the flares that they use. You can see the plane that they use in the background there. And the two bottom ones are Malaysian uh, Royal Air Force. They are cloud seeding in their operation. You can see on the right hand side, um, Dubai is now under weather, um, was, was underwater. I think my understanding is that they had one year's rain in one day. They didn't say that it was due to sea cloud seeding, but that's not normal. Weather modification program started in 1940. In the 80s, they were banned, uh, abandoned due to them being too damaging. The dimming of the sun, which is reference to in my um, written submission, um, could this be related to what's in Revelations? Amos, Isaac, and Joel. There are many patents uh, for weather modification. Lyndon B. Johnson, 36th president of the USA, record officially on record states, he who controls the weather will control the world. What is our commitment under the Paris Agreement? our connections with Australia and the United States of America on this issue, they are cloud seeding in, Amer um, in Australia. Um, what are the experiments, uh, um, sorry, what experiments are currently being done in New Zealand? The information is really hard to find because it's often experimental and so therefore the information is not yet out. Um, there are several US states right now that have passed and um, banned geoengineering. On my um, reference one is the Paris Agreement and climate geoengineering governance and the need for, the, for a human rights-based component. On page 21, it talks about SAI or sulfur aerosol injection um, might delay replenishing, uh, replenishing the ozone for decades, imperial, imperiling the health of millions also continues on that, um, the right to life. That's under the um, Un um, United Declaration of Human Rights. It says no degradation is permitted by governments, even in times of purported public emergencies. So even if there is a climate emergency declared, our right to life is still, still stands. CO2 is not a pollution, it's vital for life. This is where we get our oxygen. It also helps plants grow. When we pl grow plants, we feed 
animals and plants are for food. So it actually affects our food chain. Condensation trails and are a, a trail that where the engine hits colder um, air temperatures and they leave a trail. It's a trail that leaves behind. Usually, typically, you'll see them at night time when you're looking to the east and the sunset. And they will actually um, slowly and dissipate after about 30 seconds, a minute, they just, they disappear. Whereas chemtrails or SAIs, they actually last and they go from one edge of the horizon right across to the other edge of the horizon. In picture seven there, that is a close up of a chemtrail. Typically it's got a smooth side with the um, twills at the bottom. Picture one I sent to Mr. McKelvey when he was, before he retired, and I said to him, hey, have a look at the sky. We've got these chemtrails. What do you see? He went outside his office. He took a photo and he sent me back and he had some too. Um, I have seen him on the issue before he retired and I have also seen Suze Redman. Um, picture two is in Ruapehu. They are, there are three or four lines there and the, and the um, planes were still going. Unfortunately, I'm not very techy, so I couldn't get a video of that um, and to show you what they look like. Pictures three, five and six they were taken on the bridge to nowhere um, and they absolutely bombarded the skies as you can see and they don't dissipate easily. Picture five is um, the fattest trails I've seen and that happened to be the time when the Globemaster 111 was either from America or Australia was in New Zealand. Picture four is the typical dimming of the sun where it's sort of gloomy and it doesn't produce as much sunlight, which actually affects solar panels and stuff like that that we have. So it produces, it, it affects our, our power supply. And picture eight is Tongan. That was the day of the eruption, just actually pretty much being on the time of the eruption. There's a little rainbow of, in there and that's the aluminium particles that they're spraying. Tom Bradford, all of God cre God's creations, spiritual and physical, energy and matter, was by design made interdependent to work cooperatively in perfect harmony. Therefore, all of its parts and element elements also suffer together as a unit. Creation is bounded into one great universe. And if we interrupt with one, we disperse in another. In fact, the cloud brightening that they're doing down the way, um, I think down um, in the oceans, um, down south, they have realized that they are killing off plankton. And plankton is a huge source of our oxygen. So we actually, and it's also in the krill, and it means our fish are also suffering. So if we don't uh, say what's happening, why is it happening, and do we have our consent, we are going to end up with a planet that is going to be very um, unlivable. The action I'd like you to take. Council, be bold, stand up to government and horizons and stop the air pollution that's going on and other unreasonable environment measures. Represent and educate your constituents on geoengineering, allowing them to make informed choices, sound decisions on the issues, particularly where experiment, um, sorry, the experimental um, process, we don't know the long-term effects any weather events or health outbreaks that impact the region need to be thoroughly investigated, especially if we've seen some chemtrails observed prior to the events. Full testing of baseline, that's for air, water and soil. Remember, these chemtrails fly over open reserves of water in the region. Transparency of results is vital for public to remain informed in order to make informed decisions on the region's future. Urgent action is needed as the damage may be irreversible. I love God's creation. I love New Zealand. I'm not a bug, nor are my extended whanau or my future mokopuna, nor is my community, nor my nation, and I do not consent. Moving on to um, Otara Bridge. I've presented this picture to you before in um, the bridge. I went down to the, um, with a local iwi um, 
one of the guys there, and uh, we looked at the bridge together. He monitors the bridge quite closely, um, and he has a serious concerns, as do I. Susp suspension bridges are designed to move. Has, it, um, has the damage occurred because both ends have been restricted in movement? If you look at um, picture one, oh, sorry, picture one, this is the Rangitiki end, and it's got a full crack across the road, and then pictures two and three are the opposite side on where they have the walk board and connected to the bridge. That crack has only occurred since 2018, since those, um, since the, the new bridge was sort of fixed, so to speak. Manawatu District Council end is the other photo on the left there. That has always had a crack, the full length. And the reason being is it's because it's the approach. The approach is um, quite harsh on the bridge and you've put two speed bumps there to slow people down. Oh, what have I done? Oh, no. Um, the bolts are not in alignment. So if you, this is down, um, okay, picture five is down the Manawatu side. You can see I put a white line there. Those plates above them are actually buckled. They're not actually horizontal and straight. That plate there, in my understanding from what Jack was saying, was actually has been a new addition to the bridge since the last fix. Picture one, two, and three are all down the Rangitiki side. And they, uh, you can see the bolts are not straight. I put a black line in there to show you that it's actually, these bolts are um, not um, vertical. Um, and you've got bolts, um, sorry, the, what do you call them? Um, the washers. The washers are bent, so you can see that there's been stress on them. And bolt four is very crooked, and that's on the Manawatu side. Oh. No, but, um, the top plate of the bridge is being strengthened. We could see that with the welding. Um, but the slump is the will the slump in the bridge be fixed? Um, and have the wires been stretched on one side? Um, if only the top plate is being fixed and the restriction of the bridge movement is not being done. I'm not an engineer, by the way. I'm just looking at it from a logical point of view and from maybe the homeschooling we've done with looking at bridges and how things work in in um, together, um, will the bridge fail again? Because that's going to cost more money, and I'd rather see that it's done and done properly. Um, oh, sorry, I have gone. Oh, I have missed. I think. No, just sorry. There we are. This is really important. This is where the bridge, I think, may have stretched on one side. On, on plate one. Um, there is about a gap of 5 to 10 mil where the white arrow is. This is obviously to stop the wires from hitting the top plate. On photos 2 and 3, there is no gap. That's the opposite side where the slump is. There's obviously wear on the metal. You can see where the black arrow is on picture 2 that's actually notched. So there's nothing there. When I was standing on the bridge and we had um, a car come across, you could see that there was movement in the bridge on that side. But I didn't stand on the other side. There was no other vehicle coming at that particular point in time. So I couldn't uh, monitor that side. And like I say, I had a video, but I couldn't. I'm not techie. Sorry. My solution is action, actually. Get a second opinion, particularly on the bridge being heavily restricted in movement with a different consultant. Medically, a second opinion is not going back to the same doctor. Remove the sharpness of the speed bumps. I did complain to Mr War about it, Councillor War, and um, they painted them, which was fantastic. That makes it a lot more visual for people to see. Um, but low cars, that's locals, and other people are actually losing their undercarriage on their, on their car. Um, especially the electrical ones, just by the way, I find quite, that quite amusing. But all the diesel ones are obviously higher, and I've also cycled over those and nearly fell off because they're very, very sharp. Um, so moving them and making them a bit smoother will be kinder on vehicles. Um, clear a signage. At the bottom there, you can see we've got a negotiator uh, on picture one. You've got the signs on the left-hand side. The driver sits on the right-hand side. We've got to negotiate that concrete uh, chicane. And the signs probably should be on the right-hand side 
it's only a one-way bridge. And that's for tourists in particular, because the tourists don't realise, they don't use the bridge very often, and it just means that it reminds them one person at a time, or it means that also for the speed. I know that that's probably typically not what you would do, but it would be more appropriate and would stop people from having following you in behind, not realising, because they are trying to negotiate the two chicanes. Um, and that's it. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Angela. Um, oh, hang on. Sorry, I lie. <laughs> sorry, but wait, there's more. <laughs> um, okay. The Mofonga Dam releases. There's two issues on this slide. Um, actually, three. Um, the Mofonga Dam, this is the picture um, is taken um, on the 30th. Um, just been. They were going to release the dam on the 1st. They decided not to release the dam because the um, their, whatever their things that they do, they did the testing. Um, so it's still fishable at in March. Okay. We are concerned that it's environmentally damaging, especially during the high recreational months in January and March. We want the action. I have also spoken to, uh, on these issues to Horizons, but I do believe that you work hand in hand and that we need to keep everyone accountable. And one voice doesn't actually counter for everything. Um, ban the release during low flow times where the sediment settles for long periods and it kills and leaves the sediment a sludge of about a, an inch um, across the board, which kills the aquatic life. Farmers are wearing the brain for the sediment in the river, while it's the impacts by, caused by Genesis Energy get ignored. Watch now. This is really important. It makes a mockery of the intensive winter grazing policies that the horizons have put in. Okay, moving on to the unsealed roads. Unsealed roads contribute to sediment. This is one factor that the um, Horizons had not considered because I did discuss this with them when, at a Rangatira golf course meeting. Um, have you considered this? I'm not asking for the roads to be tar sealed. I'm asking for you guys to have a little bit of um, mitigation or understanding when it comes to farmers can't help some of the issues that they do, nor can unsealed roads. One third of New Zealand roads are unsealed. And if you look at the health government, um, I've put up there in blue, the health impacts of M, uh, sorry, PM10 unsealed roads. That's very interesting reading on how much that affects human um, people and the population. They did a study. Okay, moving on also to the underbench waste disposals. Ban immediately these in new builds. This type of pollution is environmentally um, damaging. Those who have septic tanks are aware of this type of damage, and that's why we would not put them into our homes. Um, I would really like to see that you um, can ban these and reduce some of the, the sediment and stuff issues from the urban. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Um, you've certainly covered a great deal there, Sorry. and there's a lot, lot in there to consider. Let's open it up to questions on any of the topics. Councillor Underwood. Um, you've mentioned that the farmers are getting um, all the blame for the sediment in the river, um, and cloud seeding seems to involve quite a few chemicals. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that fallout from that is also contaminating the rivers? Have you any evidence of that? Absolutely. Well, I don't have any evidence, but I know overseas they have done trials. And um, 10 years ago, they had no aluminium in the soil and, then, and even on um, high mountains and stuff. And they've actually analysed them. And over, over a decade, they've ended up with huge particles of aluminium. And there's no excuse for them to be in the areas that they have. So I do believe that these are falling actually onto people with having a lot of issues with um, shortness of breath, SOB. And that means an, an asthma. And I know that um, the Asthma Society, I have actually got that in my written submission, talks about thunderstorm asthma. And that is due to the plants being, um, they're, they're changing because of the amount of chemicals and also what they're doing with dimming the sun and they're not being able to reproduce at the normal rate that they, the, their God-given um, rate that they would normally do. So yes, I do believe that that would be there. Thank you. Thank you. 
any further questions around none thank you um angela thank you for the time and effort that you've put into this um a lot of research um, and then the extra information that we can follow through for referencing. Um, also, some, giving us solutions. It's one thing to raise a concern, but to give us potential solutions to look at is, um, is great. So appreciate the time that you've done for this. Thank you for coming in today. Um, and we will get back to following our deliberations. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Right, team, um, we will take a break for lunch, and if we can be back, please, ready to start for, at one twenty. Thank you.
Well, we'll do. We don't talk about motor vehicles. <laughs> right. Uh, Colin's just updated me. Welcome, team. Welcome back uh, for this afternoon's hearings. Um, and first up, we're on page 68. Welcome, Alan. Don't need to call you to the table. You're there, ready and waiting. Yep. Um, so thank you. We've read your submission and you're welcome to speak to it. And then there may be some questions. Well, I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Helen, Deputy Mayor Michael and rest of the council team. Uh, thank you for this opportunity of speaking to my submission. It's going to be in bits and pieces. Uh, I'm starting off with uh, number one issue is Kauai Park Averys. Then I'm going to go to um, climate change, not the theory, but the practical financial impact of climate change. I read in a scientific article. And then um, Colin over, Councillor Colin has just updated me. I don't know, need to do anything on roading differentials because he's updated me. <laughs> and then I'll do a fielding town centre and revenue. And that's if I get to my 10 minutes. Excellent. Thank but you. You better cut me off when when I go too long, Helen. Thirty well, seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, we'll start off with issue two, Kauai Park Averys. Um, I think it's important for the Manawatu District Council, in my view, to build a new Avery facility because, as we know, the present one—I don't know if it's still there or gone by now—it was or is totally inadequate. And anyway, we need a new one to provide more space for birds and give them more lighting because uh, it was too sheltered in the past and it was inadequate lighting. Now, I've got a few observations and family stories here, so I'll have to cut this down, otherwise it'll be too long. Uh, when we as a family just arrived in the Manawatu, the first, my uncle said to me, you've got to go to Kauai Park and see the Avery. So we did that. Well, um, there was a, a pretty cool bird there, Tui, called Jack, Jack the Tui. I don't know if you guys remember Jack the Tui, but he was very talkative. And my wife remembers well when he said, you still here then? <laughs> and my wife was walking away and uh, he said that. And I went to the hairdresser the other day to make myself presentable for the council meeting today. And she said to me, that uh, she's quite prepared to drive from Palmy to Kauai Park because um, compared to Palmy, can you believe this? A Palmist North person says Kauai Park is the best. And I said, but what about the Esplanade? What about all your parks in Palmist? No, Kauai Park is the best. That's, I know, I know that's just one person in Palmist North. But anyway... Um, Getting into demographics, um, according to council documents, uh, the council reckons we're going to have an increasing proportion of under 20s and over 60s. And unfortunately, those aged between 20 and 60 is going down, but the, but the okay. under 20s and the over 60s is going up. Now, there's a third group I want to talk about is the neurally diverse, neural divergent people. And it's these three groups, I think, would be attracted like a magnet to Avery's because um, there's a guy, like any good journalist, my sources are not revealed. Um, this neurally diverse person was prepared, quite prepared to hop out of the car, rush out of the car, leave the parents behind and go straight to the Avery and talk to the birds. Didn't want to talk to any human. Talk to the birds. And... So I'm taking that under 20s and over 60s would like to do that too. Now, um, so my question for the council, I know Michael told me not to ask questions. So this is a rhetorical question, Michael. Um, $840,000 a quote for a new Avery seems stupid to me. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm pretty sure the council wouldn't be prepared to wear that figure. I, as a ratepayer, wouldn't be prepared to wear it, and I've spoken to a few other ratepayers, and, and they balk at that figure. So what about taking a leaf out of the council's history book? If we go back to 1964, 
the JCs made a community project building an aviary. Why can't um, a council contractor by the name of Daryl Curry be a supervisor and he can apply the Animal Welfare Act of 1999 code because apparently any new aviary has to abide by the Animal Welfare Act of 1999 and cause no harm or suffering to any animal contained therein. And so you could draw in the um, public uh, communities like the, um, uh, we've got two, two Marae, we've got Aorangi and uh, Te Kalfata. They could be, they could help in and give a blessing. And uh, we've got quite a few young community groups. They could help to reduce labour costs. And I'm sure there's, Lots of people my age who's got wood stashed in their garage who'd be willingly donate it to a cause like this. So the cost, I'm sure, could be done for way less than $400,000. Do you, Council, agree with that? I know you're not supposed to ask, but I ask that as a rhetorical question. Please go away and think about that because I'm pretty sure we, we need a tourist attraction in fielding and out of our history book, a Kauai Park Avery would be a magnet to people coming in from north, south, east and west from our regions into fielding. Right, so that's, so that's um, <coughs> Avery done. Right, any questions? <laughs> no, keep going to keep to time. Oh, OK, well, I'll, we don't need to do... Number, issue one, thanks, thanks to Colin, Councillor Colin over here. So we'll pass on that. Fielding Town Centre, uh, parking limit enforcement, and I vote for option A, because in my view it's the fairest, as the entire cost of enforcing parking time limit would be paid for through general rates, and also it's a fair cost distribution of being right across all rate payers. And then... Um, Revenue and financing funding mixes. I agree with animal control, building control, consent planning, but now solid waste, that's my issue. I disagree with, I think it should be, I vote for the status quo, option A, because council needs to keep user fees at a minimum because we've got to reduce the incidence or likelihood of fly tipping. If you have too high a user fee, it's going to increased fly tipping. Now I'll whiz over to um, the tech, I'll finish with the technical one. Hopefully you've got the food is costing more due to climate change and prices will keep rising. And we know about um, consumers, but I'm talking here about for long-term planning for the council. We're all well aware of um, global warming and rising temperatures. Now, uh, a study has been done on 121 countries between 1996 and 2021, along with the weather conditions for these countries, what they are exposed to, and food prices are going to increase likelihood of 0.9 and 3.2 per cent every single year, and this is likely to add 0.3 and 1.2 per cent to overall inflation. And so that's going to add into any long-term planning by any council well into the future, not just 10 years, but next 50 years. And I know this is from a uh, Northern Hemisphere study. So this is likely from a Southern Hemisphere uh, that we're in. It's likely to be the maximum. We could, be, we could get away with a, bit, a little bit less than this. So... Um, so I'll whiz over to the last page, page two. 3.2% um, is the likely increase. Higher temperatures may make food prices rise this much a year, 3.2%. So I've got in big large letters there, the Manawatu District Council needs to be aware of these issues in the financial aspects of long-term plan and other such long-term planning. And here endeth my submission. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Uh, open it up for questions. Councillor Hadfield. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship, and uh, thanks, Alan. 
So a couple of things. Um, uh, the uh, IPCC have indicated that um, temperatures have risen 2.5 degrees in the last 80 years, and, and right. they anticipate uh, 2.5 degrees in the next 80 years. And so, so I'm wondering, um, uh, given that the proposed or the potential or mapped increase is the same for the next 80 years as the last 80 years, how much of an impact that's actually going to have? So you're asserting that climate change is going to keep food crisis prices rising. That's right. My question to you is what impact do you think government regulation on the primary sector, in other words, growers, uh, is having in terms also in terms of um, um, food price increases uh, and operating costs for the primary sector and whether or not you would actually potentially um, think that that p potentially uh, uh, regulatory uh, intervention is actually more of, of a factor in price increase than perhaps uh, climate events. Yes. Um, my lawyer once said to me when I was running my business, Alan, stick to your knitting. And I said, excuse me? What, do, what does that mean? And he said, you, you're a chemist, Alan, so stick to chemistry. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, Grant, your question's a little bit out of my knitting. But um, I will say this, that... Um, I believe the government has got a, uh, a role to play in its um, overall uh, responsibility with farmers, but um, farmers also have a responsibility with local councils in that they've got to comply with local council and regional council regulations. Now, according to this study, with the increase in temperatures, farmers who um, were doing livestock may have to go to other cropping methods because it's thus just not <laughs> going to be viable with the increase in drought. I understand the Manawatu area is going to have more and more droughts and floods. Both are on. So I'm worried about the droughts, and that's going to cause a likely change in the type of farming we have around the Manawatu. And so I believe with all the pressures on farmers, councils and governments are going to need to help farmers to change their way of farming. And there's a type of farming, um, organic type of farming, where you can plough this stuff into the ground. And so this is a way of reducing costs. <coughs> and councils may have to, and governments may have to help farmers more than they have done in the past, simply because they're having to change at a greater rate of knots than ever before. I don't know if that answers your question, Grant, but that's my attempt at it. <laughs> don't tell my wife. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Alan. Uh, we have run out of time, but um, thank you so much for taking the interest and the effort to make your submission and join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. When do we hear back, Helen? <laughs> You're set, Colin. I won't vote for you. <laughs> so our, our deliberations will start um, straight away and then uh, we have to have our long-term plan signed off by the end of June. Oh, good. Right. Here back before the end of June, hopefully. Correct. Yeah, pretty <laughs> Anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Right, let's welcome up Joe. We're on page 74. Come and join us at the table. Um, is Kerry with you, or are you doing two separate? Two separate. Okay. Thank you. So welcome, Joe. Thank you for your submission, uh, which we've read. And you're welcome to speak to it, and there may be some questions. Right, thank you, Mayor Helen and all the council people. Right. Is that? Can you hear me? We sure can. Oh yeah. Now about the Avery. Yes, I agree with everything Alan said. Thank you. Um, you're welcome, Alan. Um, yes. It, I mean, I'll just say it like it is. Is it going to be gold for eight hundred thousand? I mean, really. Um, people in fielding should be able to help you out with that, whether it's you know, like us, helping out or businesses, surely somebody will be able to do it for cheaper than that. We've looked at it. We go all the time and we love it. We love talking to Polly, the 
cockatoo is beautiful. And um, and there's heaps of kids, uh, ladies with babies and prams, parents, all sorts of people, different ages. Kerry and I are down there all the time, as I said. They all love it. And we've looked at the back of the brick wall, and all that seems to be all intact. It's just the wood and the... Um, fencing you know and probably the inside their cages need repairing and yes and some of those trees may be cut down so it gives a bit of light into it because I really don't think we need any more flowers because we've got the roses and who wants more flowers <laughs> people love the birds um right. so that's it about the birds but now I'll go on about um what I said in my paperwork about the wishing well. Used to be there, everyone knows where it used to be. Not there, haven't put it back there. And we loved it. So did the kids, um, other kids. And um, also the chair by the duck pond. You know the one I mean? That was, you know when the, the fountain, the rocks and all that are there? It was yeah. right there on that little spot and somebody just took it and it's never been put back. And Kerry and I love sitting there and, you know, just resting and talking to the ducks and looking at the fish and all sorts of stuff. Um, now, on a good thing, the playground is amazing. You did a good job of it. Beautiful. Lots of people use it. We've even used the swings ourselves. We love it. But what would be appreciated is, is um, if you could put a toilet down that end. Not, not for us, but for the kids, because you've got to walk six miles to get to the toilets up the top, you know. Um, but it would be good if you could put toilets down there. That would be excellent. And um, is there a, because um, we don't really drive down there, we park up the top and walk down. Is there a disability car park down there? Anybody? <laughs> not designated. No, well, it might be good if you put one of those down, that other end, the park end. Um, and also, I meant to say this about the Avery too. You know the bird feeder that stands up in the middle of the thing with the little bird feeder box on it? Well, if you're going to do the Avery, which I hope you do, would you think you'd be able to stick a new stick up at a new box on there as well for the birds? Because, you know, they that's rubbish. It's nearly falling down. But we'd like to go and do it ourselves. But, I mean, Kerry's too old and un unwell and that to do anything, and I can't really get up and do stuff. So, yes, but that was all I was wanting. Please keep the breeze. It's good for fielding. Thank we you. And we certainly beat Palmerston North, so. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, any questions? Um, I, I love the passion, so thank you. It's great to hear the passion from the community, so well done. Uh, any questions of Joe? What was your, what was your view on whether we should keep the Avery's? <laughs> Please. I'll tell you what, listen here, you will not regret it. Poai Park gets used like nobody's business. I don't know whether you've all anybody's been down there and sat down there, but if we're not sitting there, you know, we can't bother to lose there. But if we're not there, we're over the other side because we go down and watch the the men play cricket sometimes. And um, the amount of people that go in and out, in and out, and, and now the playground's there. It's you know mm. excellent. Great. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much you. for your time. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you for yours. Thank you. Kerry, come and join us. I don't think she's missed anything, so uh, <laughs> you might have hard trouble filling it in. Right. Um, I'm Kerry Hewitt. I'm a 69-year-old that's lived in Manawatu all my life. Um, First 60 years in Palmy and the last nine years in fielding. Um, this is right out of my comfort zone. I'm here because I'm impressed with the amount of effort that I've seen you guys in staging this to give everybody like me and like Joe a chance to have our say. Mm. Otherwise, I would I would never normally do this sort of thing. But I've I, I, really appreciate giving the chance someone like myself 
to come along and talk to you is marvellous. So I commend you for the idea. Right? Now, my my thing with, with Avery, firstly, I, I definitely want it. Um, resurrected and renovated and um, I've been to the one in Palmerston North that they recently redone um, a few years ago and um, that's a real gem there and I really believe if you if you get rid of if you get rid of the Avery from Kai Park you, you're taking a big step backwards in my opinion it's one of the biggest attractions okay, you've got the new playgrounds and all that, but I can remember the days way back when I used to take my kids along when it was first built and all the Makino pool there was, I think it was an 83 stamp. That's when my son was actually born. Um, so it goes back a long way with sentimental values and memories for me when my kids were young. Um, I've got one of these disability you've got to be pretty bad to get one of those this has got another year to go maybe they think I'm going to hang on another year but these are five year five year things I got the maximum one my mobility is pretty short and with the Avery there it's a nice little distance for me to, to be able to handle each day um, it gives gives me reads and it gives me a goal and motivation to, to walk around the block and go past the birds and it, it gives me incentive to to go out for my daily walk and that's really hard for me because I, I'm only good for a couple of hundred metres at a time um, and it's just a nice distance and I, I feel encouraged to go more often. I, I should go every day, you know, it's, an, it's a reason to go for my walks each day. So that's another reason I want it there. And Jay touched on the um, seat on the other side of the um, duck pond. We're talking about the one that's facing east. It, it's yep. it's around the other side, op opposite the toilets. And there used to be a, a seat there. I don't know, all of a sudden it was gone and it's never been replaced. We're talking like maybe a year, 18 months ago. I'm just wondering if that can be replaced because distance-wise for me, by the time I get round there, I'm pretty, you know, I need to have a rest. Um, and that was a good little spot for me to just be able to sit down for a few minutes and catch my breath and uh, carry on my walk back to the car. So it would be nice if that could be replaced. Um, I think Jay's already touched on the... Um, the other um, playground, um, toilets and, and a disability park would probably be a good thing too. Um, you know, you've got to be pretty bad to get one of these disability parks and um, they don't give them away very freely and um, people that need them really do need them and I think it's a good idea to... And it looks good too when you come and if you see, it, it, it just looks good. From my point of view, it's nothing nicer than saying, "Oh, good, I can get my pack," you know, and mm -hmm. makes makes life so much easier for me. And with all of the problems I've got with me, um, you know, I've got massive cardiac issues too, which are irrelevant. But my mobility is the biggest thing, as far as the walks are concerned. And I just love going to Kai Park. I go there lots and lots of times, and um, I just hope we never lose the Avery. So thank you for all listening. It's great to have a chance to talk to you all. And um, thanks for the effort. Thanks, Kerry. Um, thank you. And thank you for coming to see us with your submission and talk about what it means to you, because that's really important that we understand um, why people you know, are so passionate about some of these things. And they may not seem significant, but for other people they are. So really appreciate that. Thank mm -hmm. you. A question, Councillor Quarry. Thank you for coming along today. Um, you've mentioned your disability and, and uh, we want to take that on board. How many, um, would you like to see additional parking places allocated for uh, disabled people? And if you would, where would you like to see them throughout the town? Um, 
We're not talking about Kai here, are we? Or no, anywhere? fielding in general. Oh, gosh. Um, I can't think of anything right now. Um, it would be good if there was a stick in the Kauai Park. It would be good if there was actually a um, another disability park at the other end, like there's a couple by the toilets, but there's nothing on the extreme left of the, the last car park. If that was a disability park, car park would be good because it's that little bit less distance to have to walk. And even though it might only be 50 minutes, 50 metres to you, that's a lot for me. And mm. also up the other end where the new car park is, if one could be put up there as well, would, would be great too. But what, what about the centre of town? Well, I've, never, I've, I've always managed to find somewhere. Um, yeah, it's, it's nothing annoying when there aren't any. Um, but, yeah... I don't go to town that much, so I haven't really... But, yeah, could do with a few more. Um, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much. And, again, to both of you, thank you for making time to come and talk to us today. All right. Cheers. Thank you. I'll just say about um, the, um, the new walk you've done with the story down there as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Love it about the hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> and that there are more to come, so even better. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're now on page 78. Welcome, Chris. Come and join us. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris, for your submission. And the um, see, we've got a copy of a note, so appreciate that. Uh, we have read your submission. But you're very welcome to speak to it, and then there may be questions. Right, thank you. Um, you've got two bits of paper because I, I tossed the first one off and then thought mm, maybe there's a couple of technical things in there that some people might not understand, so that's why you've got the <coughs> second page. And I have to say, I blame Councillor Short for some of this. <laughs> As a result of an exchange on Facebook about the new murals outside the Civic Centre, it sort of started a a train of thought about how the council could raise money for things like community arts projects and stuff like that, rather than taking mm. it directly out of rates or going to community um, arts funding funds. So there we go. You, you've got it. I started because I was a bit disappointed that solar panels were not included as, as part of the architectural design on the new library because seriously, you put solar panels on the roof of that library as a percentage of the total budget, it's actually a really, really small percentage, and you have the opportunity there to pay for the running, the daily running costs of the libraries. That's your air conditioning and the um, lighting, lighting. lighting and heating. So I think my push really is, council, get a bit thinking about this, and look at opportunities where you can make passive income. The solar panels are passive income. Once you've spent the money in putting the panels up, there's actually not much you have to do after that. You just have to, every now and then, send someone up and give them a bit of a clean and check that they're still there. But other than that, yeah. <laughs> other than that, they just sit there and earn your money. And I also come from, when I lived down south, I was on a community hall committee and we had endless trouble getting money out of the Horofenua District Council to pay for the ongoing maintenance on our little hall. And if we'd had solar panels, we could have said to HDC, there you go, that pays for the power, the light, mm. and, the, and for the guy to repaint the back wall of the, of the hall type of thing. So those are my thoughts. You've got them there. And I go, questions, because... Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, let's open it for questions. Anything? Councillor Hadfield. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Chris. I, I, I'm just a bit interested in this uh, last bit of paper. Oh, yeah. Um, how, how many... Um, talking about a big battery. Oh, yeah. So, how, how many batteries from Nissan Leafs would oh, you need I, in, in a big battery? I have no idea. It... it it's about it's a cube about 1.8 meters cubed, and 
I went up there to do the compliance checking. You open the doors and it's just full of electronics and little lights and wires. And my eyes glazed over because that wasn't part of my thing. But there's old and Leaf batteries that are taken into a factory, reconditioned, and then they're monitored at a cell level, which is quite smart. And it's an Australian company that's doing it. And it's... It's an innovative piece of technology, but putting that one one side, a big battery bank at places, say, like the Marae down the road, where you might want to use it as a civil defence emergency centre, solar panels on the roof, so the iwi that has got that Marae Red. up the top of Makino Road there, they've got a couple of places where they've got, you know, like, they've got I can't remember how many panels on the Whareinui there, but there's the Marae and Halcom, and they've got, I think they must be getting close on 200 panels on the Whareikai and the Whareinui. And their next stage are going to be to put some battery in, and that will give them power in a civil defence emergency. You pull people in, and you can house them, mm -hmm. feed them without any external input at all. And it's free, right, other than the capital cost. Yeah, like the capital cost is one thing, and this this iwi have got funding from a couple of iwi authorities and also um, Central Energy Trust. Uh, but you know, to come back to the library, uh, as a percentage of the total budget, it's chump change, basically. Mm, thank you. Councillor Bell. Tēnā I, um, <clears throat> I was just looking at sort of the supplementary reading that you had and you mentioned to Tikanga Marae. I just want to acknowledge um, the person that arranged that was um, the late Graham Everton. Have you spoken with Tikanga at all about your ideas of proposing of looking at connecting that um, to the civil defence? He and I actually had a discussion with the guys who installed it. Right. Um, we had a discussion on site and I, and that was certainly going through the back of his head, but unfortunately, I don't know that that got out before he he departed, Right. unfortunately. Um, because you're right about those numbers, um, and many of the other marae were just starting to expand um, for it to be very similar to, to Tikanga. Um, if I would just make a recommendation that this afternoon to Tikanga will be presenting their submission, if you're more than welcome to come back and sit in the gallery. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Balski. Um, yeah, I can see your point on solar panels. I've got 24 bought years ago, and today I'd only need 12 to produce the same amount of power. So I, I think we should have our um, eye on this, and as technology gets better and better at um, yep. absorbing the UV rays and turning them into energy, I think we should be certainly be alert to that. So thank you for bringing it. Yeah, you know, and I just encourage the council to to sort of think about that. And not only that, it does wonders for your green credentials. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chris. You Thank you very so much. Please, Helen. Oh, sorry, Alison. Sorry, tucked down the bottom there. Yeah, Counts sorry. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for coming in and accepting the challenge. Would you believe of all weeks I've got COVID, so I'm doing this online. So I would have liked to have been in the room to hear your presentation. Well done. You know, yeah. I'll catch up on that paperwork next week when I'm back on board but um your timing was perfect when you were asking your questions I said well why don't you write a, a submission and here you are so thank you for doing that no problem great thank you so much thank you thank you right we're now on page 81 and welcome Bev and Lou come and join us Thank you. Thanks for your submission, which we have read. And um, so you're welcome to speak to it, and then there may be some questions. Yes, thanks very much for the opportunity to um, come and speak to the submission on parking limits and central fielding. Um, I understand that the submissions were called for during April and uh, the uh, opportunity to speak to those submissions is... Um, at the moment, but the other day, or a couple of weeks back now, um, I was quite surprised to see that 
quite a number of the signs have already been installed. Mm. Now, I thought we we're in a democratic uh, community and that uh, submissions would be presented and hearings would be heard before any work was done. So I was just a little surprised when I saw that um, many of the signs, uh, if not most of them, are already in place. Um, and just going on from that, um, it, uh, Fielding is a, is a place where it's friendly, it's welcoming, um, and just to see the number of signs that are up now, the place is cluttered with them. You know, we've got beautiful gardens, beautiful um, uh, surroundings, uh, the paving, the seats, the lamp stands, you know, everything's look, looking good. Now we're cluttered with signs. Um, so uh, I'm just uh, wanting, and, and also I just acknowledge that, you know, to have a, a sign-free uh, environment uh, uh, in, in the town centre and uh, just having a place that's welcoming and inviting for people from out of town to be able to come in uh, and now they see all these signs. It's quite confusing uh, with all the different time limits. There's about three or four different time limits. Um, so, uh, and Bev's just going to elaborate a little bit more on um, some of the issues that um, maybe we as uh, people in the community and the individuals uh, have found the situation. Thank Thanks you. for having us. This is the first time I've ever done this. <laughs> um, don't, I normally just keep it to myself, but I just um, went down one morning for the walk and there they all were, and we might have been out of timing ourselves as to when what was being done, but it took me by surprise. Um, and I just want to say to my thing that for us personally, it doesn't matter too much because we've now shifted very close to town and we mostly walk into town anyway. Um, but for others, I think it does. And I also want to say thank you so much for the orbiter and um, bus. And I, I do ask that you keep that on, although I know sometimes there's not that many people on it. But it's I have um, a couple of elderly aunties that use it a lot and wouldn't be able to get around. So thank you for that. And that does mean that people can get into town. You're right. Um, but I'm not sure that, that the time limits and everything are going to make too big a difference uh, for those, um, particularly those shop owners who are, who are hoping for parks to be um, available near their shops and that will increase people coming through. I remember, um, I've been in Fielding for many years, and I remember when my um, oldest, who's now nearly 50, um, was a baby and then I had a t uh, another one, a um, couple of others, but I had a baby and a toddler and we had 60 minute time limits, 60 minutes a very short time. And we had those time limits and I'd go into town, I'd get them out of the, we didn't have very good car seats, but out of what, what they were, I'd get them into the push chair and in the toddler and we'd walk around and we'd go to one shop and it took quite a while to get anything done. And you'd get back and the time was up and you'd have to get out of the, to put them out of the push chair, back into the thing, shift the car um, somewhere else. Um, it also means that more cars are going around trying to find parks still. So I don't know that that's going to make a big difference um, of parks available. And I just know how difficult that was for me. Um, and I see young mums and dads downtown, and an hour goes so quickly, um, doesn't it? And I was just thinking in my thing, I wrote out a few other t things. You know, the Thokal Theatre um, on a Tuesday gives morning tea to us older people and um, you can't see a film and have a coffee in an hour you know so um, you go and um, I have pe uh, meet up with friends who come over from Palmerston um, and we go and have a coffee and I can tell you we don't get through all what we want in an hour either um, you know it's just such a short time for people to get what they need to do and to create a uh, a space where in our mid in our centre where it is welcoming and where it's called, where it's creating communion not communion community um, oh and do commune with each other you know um, and so if you're always looking like I went out um, in Palmerston 
well, unfortunately, for coffee, and uh, put the money in the, in the parking meter. And I thought, well, right, good, I'll put half an hour more in, in, than I need so that I don't have to sit there looking at my watch. Um, and that was good, but came back and I had a $200 fine because I didn't have a warrant of fitness. But <laughs> at any rate, beside the point. So I just, I just feel quite strongly about it. And I know it's too late, really. They're all up. But I just felt I wanted to speak in, on behalf of those older people who aren't, as um, the speaker before said, it's quite hard to get those mobility um, things. And so, you know, they take a longer time. They go to see a shop. They, they move around a bit slower. Um, people go for a coffee. They're just going to go home. If, if the time's up, they're not going to hang around and, and potter. And when we potter and look at shops and just do our window shopping, it's when we often kind of get sucked in. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so that's because I just wanted to put that out there. I don't think anything can change, really. But thank, um, thank you, yeah. um, thank you to you both. Mm. Just for clarification, um, mm. council made the decision to introduce time and force parking late last year. Um, so the signs and everything were okay. ordered then. Mm. The long-term plan um, discussion that we were asking from the community was: how do you, who do you think should pay oh, okay. 